All right, we are live. The producer's just in my ear telling me I'm on air, so uh, I'll stare vacantly at the camera like an idiot for a few seconds, no doubt, and then talk. Here we are. It is the Esports Heaven Show once again. It's the third installment of what has been a peek behind uh, the veneer of esports. We've got some great guests for you tonight. Um, first thing that I will tell you about, though, is what are we going to be talking about? Well, uh, we do like to try and tackle subjects other people haven't tackled, which apparently we didn't do when we talked about journalism with that wonderful car crash show last fortnight. If you didn't watch it, do check out the VOD. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about tonight is content, video content, the streaming revolution, the joy of producing regular content for a mostly ungrateful audience. And uh, one of the guys who uh, has had pretty much all the success that you can expect to from this kind of industry is with us as our first guest. He's probably the most high-profile guest we've ever had on the show, although maybe Red Eye won't like that one so much, I don't know. But it is, of course, DJ Wheat. That's Marcus Graham to people who know him. Marcus, I cannot thank you enough for uh, joining us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, obviously, uh, definitely one of the topics that I absolutely love. And that makes it even more uh, exciting to be here. You know, talking about esports is great, but honestly, at at the heart, I am a content creator. You know, I do, I, I do love this stuff. So it's it's really cool to get a chance to chat about it. Well, I'm just going to throw us uh, straight in. I mean, like what we did last time, foolishly, as I found out, was we, we asked Slasher for a brief overview of his career. And uh, 30 minutes later, <laughs> we were talking about lots of other stuff. So uh, maybe maybe is it safe to ask you for a brief overview of how you got into all this shit? Honestly, it's really not. It's really, I would. <laughs> I want to talk about the, the topic and not necessarily Good. about the history. But, you know, what I will say, though, that I think is relevant to, to all this discussion is that I think even from the beginning and when I say the beginning like I remember in in junior high you know we would get projects for school and what would I do I would get out the video camera with the VHS tapes and do like hack job edits in the media room and try to and be like well I did a video for my presentation mm. like I have been doing the content creation thing for as long as even I can remember you know it's just sort of evolved over time whether that was making uh, you know, English videos on, on a VHS tape or, um, uh, you know, creating music or, or at that point then doing audio broadcasts into video broadcasts. It's just always been something that I've really loved to do. Mm. Right. Well, okay. Well, let's, let's talk about how you make it work for you because it's, it's no uh, exaggeration. I think like, if I was to say that to name somebody that had been in the business for a long time and was perceived to be successful. I think most people would get around to saying your name. If it wasn't the first one, it would be second, definitely top three every time. So how is it you've managed to turn it around and, and, and kind of be around for as long as you have, make it work for you, do it across many games? You know, what is the secret of the kind of success? Um, you know, honestly, I wish I knew the exact answer because I feel like I would try to bottle that and sell it. And that's where I would make some real money, Richard. But, um, in all seriousness, you know, I, and it sounds really cliche to be like, I just kind of, uh, just kind of went for it. You know, I just kind of, I, I tell people all the time, you know, when they ask, how did you get into this? It's like, I just, you know, I just loved it so much that I was willing to put in as much work as was humanly, uh, you know, possible. Mm -hmm. That meant that when I first started broadcasting Quake over Shoutcast, which is essentially internet radio, yeah. I would do it seven days a week for, for a solid month, like while a tournament was going on. I'd come home from work, and I would just broadcast. And, you know, uh, what that did for me initially is it helped me establish my name, but more mm -hmm. importantly... It was literally like going to fucking school every single night, right? Because I did I never commentated a game before really. I just kind of was going off of what I thought was right. And all this time just allowed me to refine it and to to figure out how to present things and how to you know, use speech to capture one interest. Like it was literally like studying every night. And I think that because I just did that so much that I, I kind of fell into this, uh, I, I, I sort of, I guess like a, a path that was like, hey, you know, try it, try this or try that. And I eventually got to the point where I was like, look, I'm not going to be able to just have a career if I focus on Quake. Mm. And so at that point, I just said, I want to be able to focus on all of esports. 
I was already very interested in, in games in general. And I, I think that just those two things is that working hard, taking that initiative, putting yourself out there and doing it is, is one half of it. And then I, I guess I mean like being smart about what types of content you're creating. But in terms of making that career, I think that timing was a big part for me. Mm. I, I won't lie. Like, I mean, it, to be totally honest, like I sort of got in at this time where no one else was doing it. I was willing to put forth the effort on the sound quality that I was delivering and, and the content that I was producing. And I put my hours in. And because of that, it let me put a lot of roots in. Mm. Um, that, to be totally honest, that was a big part of, uh, you know, the, some of the success. What was the community like back in the day specifically? Like when you first started doing it? Because I know a lot of the people that are uh, doing it now, the kind of driving force uh, to make them do it, to, to make them want to come back and produce more content. It generally seems to be just having that community love, that community respect. And if that isn't there, they get very disheartened very quickly. So back in the day, I mean, Paul talked about it when we did our shoutcasting uh, spectacular, as we right. called it. Uh, he was talking about how everyone loved the early shoutcasters because there was no one else. And what they, everyone knew they were doing it for free. It's a very different community now, I think. So let's talk about the good old days. I mean, did you get nothing but love back when you started? Y yes and no. I mean, it, keep in mind, right? Like the haters, they have to exist in order for the circle of life to function. And if the one isn't there, then, you know, the whole universe collapses in on yeah. itself. But, you know, what was interesting, Richard, is that back in the day, I remember a ton of community support. But, but what existed back then that doesn't really exist now was the versus mentality. For example, it was ITG versus TSN. And ITG was me, Red Eye, Toss Pots, our old radio station, gaming radio station. And TSN was to the Team Sportscast Network, which was essentially the first and, and a company that I had worked for. So a lot of times there was this mentality, this like, you know, it's inside the game versus, or it's Radio ITG versus TSN all the time. And so there was a lot of community wars that, that happened uh, as a result of that. There was never this hand-holding. Like, in this day and age, the way that's like, yeah, we'll work with you and you'll do this and we'll partner up on this and you guys will cast over here, fucking shit never happened because it was like we, you know, our group and, and this group. Yeah. Um, you know, that was probably one of the most unique differences in esports then uh, versus now. Well, in that case, then, it's a slight tangent, but it's definitely worth following up on. Do you think that esports is perhaps stagnating at the moment because of that lack of cutthroat competition? No. No, because there's still, there's still a mentality of, like, everyone wants to... Everyone wants to have the best content. Everyone mm. wants to produce. You know, everyone's looking to one up each other. Now yeah. it's just much more friendly. Like before, it was like they fucking stole our trade secrets, man. Like they duplicated something that we did first, and yeah. we took that shit seriously. Like now, it should be a wake up call to anyone making content to be like, okay, you know, we have to step up now, or or we have to uh, we have to move up now. But I think the 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 expectation of the audience is the most important, you know, is the most uh, important way to gauge uh, and, and to, um, I, uh, what am I looking for? Like, the, so essentially, the audience will dictate a lot of times the quality uh, and those expectations, as is as, as kind of apparent now as people are making comparisons with, with WCS, yeah. for example. All right. Well, uh, it's a, again a little tangent. I've always wanted to ask you this question. Uh, we've never done an interview, so uh, it, it's something that's always interested me. Where do you draw the line between being smart uh, and, and, and knowing how to further your own career and being a sellout? I don't think you've strayed over the line into sellout territory. I know I have in my career at certain points where you just take the money for stuff you don't really believe or buy into. Um, have you ever felt like you sailed close to that wind? Do you ever feel that that kind of criticism is valid? 
the closest time for me, Richard, was undoubtedly during GGL. And that was a kind of different scenario because it wasn't like a, well, here are five jobs in front of you and you choose what you would like to do. It was a, hey, we pay your salary, man. You work for us and guess what? You're doing this shit. And there was a lot of stuff that was, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily... Um, it wasn't necessarily up my alley, but you know what? It's like, there's two ways to handle that situation is to, you know, to just kind of like do it or to do it and figure out how to put your own spin on it and, Mm -hmm. and your own mark on it. So whenever I did have to do that shit, um, I always, I always did my best to, you know, still try to do it the way that I, I would do it. If that makes any sense to you. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, because, like, I would say the HHGL, like, was I really genuinely interested in the hip-hop gaming league? Mm-hmm. Not really. Uh, the only interest I had is that, like, sure, I would like it to be successful because the company that's making it is the one that pays my paycheck. So, yeah. you know, go, go HHGL, <laughs> right? Um, I don't feel like I've ever necessarily jumped into anything that I didn't, uh, I didn't necessarily agree with or feel uncomfortable with. Uh, you know, uh, uh, nah, I mean, I, in some cases I am very grateful that I might be able to have an opportunity where, uh, I can make some, you know, some extra money from a promotional perspective, but I'm very vocal about what I like to. And if I don't like it, then obviously it's not something that I'm interested in getting involved in, but I would say GGL. Yeah, well, tell us, tell us a little bit about the Hip Hop Gaming League. Then for all those people who haven't seen this, there is actually an episode, I think, on YouTube. If you Google Hip Hop Gaming League, it's got a great scene where I think it's Snoop Dogg. You know, maybe not. Like, maybe I'm showing my age. I grew up with Snoop Dogg, man. I, I should know yeah, him. I'm pretty sure it was Snoop him. Dogg. Yeah, there you go. Uh, just in case I got it wrong and some smart ass in the Twitch chat corrected me. Uh, but yeah, basically, and it, him and Marcus have this great exchange. It's really fucking funny. Um, I mean, ch- Check it out. But tell us about it, bro. I mean, like, how the hell did that come about? Because if there's one thing that I wouldn't see kind of going together, it is like the kind of murky world of gangster rap and (laughs) esports. Like, the synergy, you know? Let me tell you something, James and Richard. Like, I honestly believe that the HHGL was a little bit ahead of its time. Now, bear with me here, right? The idea was fucking ridiculous, right? It's, so we have these two sports games. I believe at the time it was Madden yeah. and uh, NBA Live or, or one, of the, you know, one of the NBA titles. And the whole idea was, yes, we have these 18 hip-hop artists, DJs, major celebrities with Snoop Dogg as the commissioner. And they would battle it out and content would be created over their battles, culminating in a live event. It sounds very similar to kind of something that may, might happen, you know, in, in any sort of gaming community nowadays. Mm. The, the, whole, the whole thing behind it, you know, was actually pretty well done in execution. They had the names. They had the talent. These guys actually liked playing video games. The problem was is that the concept overall was lost due to a lack of technology. Mm. Now, let, now, let's put this scenario into play. Fast forward, and let's just say the Hip Hop Gaming League somehow formed today. Yeah. And Snoop Dogg and Method Man were actually playing Madden on Twitch. Now, this idea suddenly doesn't seem so fucking crazy. And it's like, dude, you know what? I think there'd be a shitload of people that would tune in. I know I would tune in just to see the craziness that it was. So to me, the, the HHGO was totally outlandish. It was totally crazy. But I think that if it was done now, it might actually work. It was just, um, you know, they wanted to try to get these 16 guys. They played group play, but they couldn't go to their houses and, and get that same experience over Xbox Live and stuff like that. And, you know, that was the biggest problem. As far as what my involvement was in, mostly it was with the finals. And all I got to say is that in my career, I shared stage time with Method Man, with Eric B, with, uh, with Snoop Dogg. And that's a pretty great check mark that I will gladly take. So it was totally ridiculous. I felt way out of my element, you guys. Like, totally. I should not have been there. But I was like, fuck it, I'm going to have fun with it. And, uh, and I guess that's that. 
What um, do you think? Do you think HHGL would actually like people would criticize the shit out of it? Yeah. But would people watch I would the hip hop gaming league if it was uh, yeah. on right now? Of course they would. Of course they would. I mean, I think I think you only need to look at the average uh, female streamer on Twitch, you know, with a fucking push-up bra or whatever. Look how many fucking views that that gets. And it's, we, we all like to, I think in esports, there's definitely a culture where we all like to pretend we're so savvy and we're so meta. Like, we're, we're not susceptible to marketing and we wouldn't get sucked into anything cheap or gimmicky. But our entire industry, for the most part, is cheap and gimmicky, right? I mean, it, <laughs> it kind of it kind of is. Um, it This... You know, I would wa I would watch it. But yeah, I'd you check know, it out. I'd, I'd watch it because uh, especially after Snoop's breakdown, like declaring himself the fucking reincarnation of Bob Marley and shit. Like, I'm definitely gonna fucking yeah. watch it now. Like, I mean, yeah. I'd definitely, it, it would be better now because of that. I think. And People and I gotta say, I gotta say, Snoop Dogg and Snoop Lion for anyone who's probably correcting in the bot yeah, or yeah, live. Uh, but Snoop Lion, that that dude is a professional man. Like, uh, I got a chance to. Dur you know, he was the commissioner, so he never actually played. Yeah. Uh, but they had him come out and, and film a bunch of, like, segments to sort of, you know, the introduction to the league and some other stuff. And he seriously could spit some mad shit. Like, he would just off the top of his head just do these takes. And I was like, man, you... You, like I had a lot more respect for that guy when I saw him do that, and I know it sounds again, it's like another one of those crazy moments. But in everyone's career, you have these moments where you see something or you experience something, and it it makes you really change the way that you think about something or the way that you're doing something. And you know, like that was one of those moments, like seeing how sharp he was. Uh, incentivized me to try to to try to get better. So yeah, thanks, Snoop. Yeah, Snoop Appreciate taught you that. everything you know. Uh, what I'm going to do is we're going <laughs> to I'm going to quickly go over to James. Now, what James has been doing, and I, I forgot to plug this at the start of the show. James is the man who lords it over the Twitter sphere, and you can uh, join in with the show tonight if you've got any questions you'd like to ask or any observations you'd like to make. Uh, you can basically. Add the hashtag esports heaven. James is going to go through it all. He's also scouring the Twitch TV chat, the Reddit threads, the Team Liquid threads, the CAD Red threads, the Tech Nine threads. It's all over the place. If you oh, want to interact, it's, it's very credit. easy to do. So, yeah, well, go, go on, James. What have, uh, yeah, what have well, you got um, for us so far? Yeah, we haven't had that many tweets in because, yes, we didn't tell everyone. But yeah, yeah. no, I'm an asshole. Hashtag yeah. esports heaven. <laughs> and uh, I'll read everything that comes through to me. And uh, yeah, let us know your opinions. And also, there's a question on screen now how can esports streams and shows be improved? So let us know what you think, and I'll, I'll put it to these guys. Um, talking about your history, uh, Marcus, um, Christopher Messer asked Was Quake Live your favorite game to cast, or would you, do you prefer games like StarCraft now? Or? Um, so. I, I mean, Quake was my first game. So Quake was the game that I played competitively. Uh, Quake is very, very dear to my heart. And it was, uh, for the longest time, my favorite you know, game to cast. And I think if, if Quake was still really, really going strong right now in some way, shape, or form, uh, you know, I would put a lot of time and effort into it. But I do have to say that my experience with StarCraft was a unique one because I sort of entered esports through Quake Live and I learned to appreciate games like Counter-Strike, games like uh, um, StarCraft and, and, and Warcraft 3 sort of through that universe, right? So it was all about Quake to me. It was like, fuck you, there's no other game that exists. It's just Quake. I was that guy. And mm -hmm. then as I started going to these events, as I met guys like, you know, like Tasteless, like uh, like Red Eye and Tosspot, they sort of bring you more into their games a little bit. So um, I I never really played StarCraft. Like, I never played it, but I watched it so much. And so I think getting a chance to play it and cast StarCraft, I feel like I missed out a lot on it, on something great that was Brood War. And although I really love Quake Live, I do absolutely think that StarCraft 2 is a phenomenal game to cast. It has everything that a caster would want from, you know, the pacing, the cadence, the downtime, the excitement, the uh, strategy, the mistakes, the emotion. I, it, it really has all of it for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, there's several other games that I enjoy casting, but those two definitely are in my top one and two spots. Yeah. Just need I can... Snoop, really. If we could yeah. get Snoop involved in StarCraft, <laughs> it would be perfect, right? 
Yeah, I can relate um, a lot to that kind of mind frame when you came from uh, Quake because I'm from a Call of Duty background and really I've only started watching League of Legends and StarCraft through, like you said, through um, through watching esports. Mm -hmm. So would you say, although it was a difficult decision at the time, it's like, I don't want to leave, you, you feel like you're better off for it, do you? Well, I never, you know, like, um, because a lot of people... A, a lot of people use the word abandoned, like we, you abandoned Quake. It's like, bro, if you want me to get out the logs of the number of hours that I put into that game, you, you know, it would make your face melt. It, like, I never feel like I would abandon a, a community like that. You know, I still watch Face It every weekend. It's like my morning coffee routine as far as streaming is concerned. I think that as anyone who is going to seriously get into a career of being a you know involved in professional gaming you have to realistically think that there's no way that any game can emulate a sport in that it can beat the ta the, the test of time mm. it cannot happen it will not happen technology dictates that it won't happen the, just the evolution of, of us as a culture dictates it won't happen. And so it only makes sense that as a commentator, you obviously go with what you love, but you don't shut yourself into just that. And, yeah. and when I had mentioned that timing was a big part of me getting into the industry, I think that that was, that was also a part of it. You know, it was before there was an explosion of many different games. And so... Um, I think I learned to appreciate that very, very early in my in my career. But you know, unless there is literally a StarCraft three, a StarCraft four, a StarCraft five, a StarCraft six, I would never want to be just a StarCraft guy. And and I'm I you know that's my personal career path. Hmm. What well, so you're saying if if StarCraft had regular iterations, you would stick with StarCraft. Is that what you're saying? No, like I'm saying I'm saying that sort. even I, I would love that. That would that would be fantastic. But you cannot guarantee that in your career path of life. Yeah. So you, you, you could go down the Call of Duty route, and they bring out one every year, and it's just not as good. Or you know, because that's how that's what I first think of when you say that, like StarCraft Six. All I can think of is how <laughs> no. Then. All I'm saying is that I hope that because StarCraft is such an amazing game, that like this company would continue to create and evolve and and you know, expand it. I, of course, I don't want it to go the Call of Duty route. And I don't. I I don't know that it can. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that um, just in the grand scheme of career moves. Getting into esports as a journalist, as uh, you know, as a commentator, as a personality, it's just not fair to yourself to believe that your game will always be there. And that's, I mean, it's just like that's it's that simple. It, yeah. it just even if it's like think about it every once in a while. Um, branch out basically. You, you know, I think yeah. I think it's a, I think it's it's what you should do definitely. Um. You were talking as well earlier about how you, when you first started out, it was shoutcasting, it was it was radio based, you know, there was no video and stuff. Um, and Red Eye brought up when he was on about the transition between shoutcasting to video. Do you? Uh, ha what was your opinion on it? Would you, what what are the pros and cons? Um, for me, it was zero issue. And um, again, I took a unique path. When I was uh, actively involved with uh, sort of esports advan advancement at GGL, I also started uh, a show that uh, you know still exists in spirit to this day, but it's called Epileptic Gaming. And as far as I know, um, as far as the history books di dictate, it was the first ever live daily video game show on the internet. Um, and I did this every fucking day for like two years straight with uh with two good buddies hogan camera carter and rance rome costa and again these moments that sort of dictate you as a you know as a person as a as your ability like every day we made a script we went to show we had to create vod's we had to try to tweet that ch or, well there was no really twitter back then but you know we had to spread the word about it's the vod's right MySpace. exactly MySpace. like it was it was a whole different ball game but you know that 
that show taught me so much about about committing to do a daily show um and uh you know i mean that transition wasn't hard because i mean when you go back and look at epileptic gaming number 96 and you can just search for it it's out there i believe it's on blip like it's the most hilarious shit ever but then fast forward to like 113 and we figured that shit out fast and you know we we did have uh uh, you know, uh, multiple cameras inside a studio with full graphics. Like we were trying to produce a show then. So for me, the transition to say hosting and and doing that side of the esports thing, it was only natural. It was like, oh well, this is just like epileptic gaming, but now it's esports, so mm -hmm. I can do I can do that. And and you know that really led to CGS, which I'm sure Paul talked about a lot in terms of learning a, a hell of a lot. But when you work for a major television you know, production company, you're going to learn shitloads whether you want to or not. So when you're right, producing um, the epileptic show, oh, no, go ahead, Rich. No, sorry, I was just going to say, um, I've got some, uh, tangent questions related to what you're uh, talking about, but I don't know yeah. if you want to, if you want to jump in, that's cool. Well, I was, you know. it was kind of related to something you said yeah. earlier, Mark, go for it, go for it. Shoot, shoot. with epileptic game, with that, when you were doing that whole multi-camera thing and you got on the grips with it, was that while you were still working and you were doing it in the evenings, like you were saying you were doing it every evening? Was that, that still um, that point? Or? Um, actually, so, well, Epileptic Gaming started back in 2002. So it is, uh, it's like now officially 11 years old. But when it was on 2002, it was a weekly three-hour radio show. And I did that 96 or 95 times. And, and when we actually got to, when I was working at GGL, we had a break and you know, GGL basically said, hey, we we're going to give you a studio. We want you to create content. And I'm like, well, fuck yeah, man. That's, that's what you hired me for. Like, I'm going to do it. One of the things that I said is that I want to do a daily video game show. Um, so that, you know, we just, it was just sort of like a natural transition. No, I wasn't working the bank stuff. This was like I was working full time in gaming. I had left okay. the bank at this point um, and I was working full time at GGL when we started. Was that, that a difficult decision to go from? doing it every night after work, putting all your time in after work, doing it. Was it a difficult decision to go from? Because I know obviously a lot of people who are creating content now aren't Hell doing it full time. no. Hell no. And let me, I mean, it was so easy of a decision because right now, think about some of the opportunities that people are taking. You know, like right now, people are taking opportunities like they are never going to happen again. Now, imagine if you got one of those opportunities in 2004. Mm -hmm. In 2000, that, that was nine years ago like I didn't even think twice about it I said absolutely I'm gonna create content for you guys we're gonna make esports huge let's do it I'm willing to take this risk now's the time go cool all right well um, what we'll do is we're gonna come back to James uh, in a little bit more we've had a flurry of questions for you Marcus so uh, we'll right. try and fit them all in um, and obviously as well later on in the show we're gonna have JP McDaniel uh, any questions you want to have queued up for him uh, now's the time. Oh, wait, you've got JP on the show right now. Yeah. yeah. I think you've got DJ Wheat on the show. Or you've got DJ Wheat after me, after, JP. Yeah. No, I, no, I, J I, JP. JP. <laughs> no, I am JP, so I don't know how JP could be. At, no, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't. It's, uh, it's, it's, too, it's too late in the evening for me, man. Like, I haven't had my meds. Like, I'll, 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 I'll go schizo, don't. Uh, but, yeah, so you can, you, you can ask questions to either of them, whoever they may be, one in the same, one incarnation. We'll, we'll, we're going to make sure we channel your questions to the right person, provided we can figure out who they are uh, at the right time. And James is going to be going over those. So use the hashtag esportsheaven, uh, and we'll move on to that. But I'm glad that James brought in uh, about transitioning because I want to talk to you a little bit about the – technicality of, of having to do that you, know, you said it was quite easy to move over to video um, and I see a lot of people that are now doing things like hosting like video shows um, they all kind of started as shoutcasters it was like the best place to learn the the discipline so at what point in your career did you start thinking you know what I want to be not just the voice I want to be the face and the voice and what kind of things did you do to make that transition smoother for yourself you know, I definitely thought I want to be the voice of, like, Quake, you know, because at the time there was no video. It, it was not until, like, 2000 and, you know, maybe five when we were really, uh, in 2004, 2005, that's when we started experimenting with video. So keep in mind we had several years of, of audio only. And, you know, that, that was the thing. Like, I wanted to be the guy that people would go to, you know, to, to commentate their tournament or to, to represent 
uh, you know, them on a show. And so, uh, you know, I, I did, you know, my best to make that happen. Like I said, I, I, I put my time in. I, I think I just started thinking less about that and more about just, you know, how, what c- contributions can I make to make all of this bigger? Mm. Um, and that would have been around the video transition. I mean, the video race for me was less about like, oh my God, it, can I make the transition from radio to video? And, because I knew I could, like I didn't have a doubt in my mind. I mean, I had a little bit of experience with it in the past, but for me, it was more like the technical side because keep in mind, like my, before I was a commentator, I worked in IT. I'm a computers guy. I like to rip shit apart. I like to put it back together. My, you know, everyone calls me when shit breaks. Uh, but so from that side, I really was so interested in the, the video part of it. And so I didn't care. Uh, it was just that transition was so necessary to, for esports, right? Because we all wanted video. We were waiting yep. for it. It was just necessary. I didn't think anything more of it other than we have to do this in order to survive. What about kind of moving towards creating your own kind of weekly show, the live on three? Uh, I think it's different when you're kind of doing stuff freelance or you get to hide behind being the, you know, being the voice of a game, being the face of a game. Because the game exists, you have no influence on that. You just kind of come along, cast it, people pay you to do it. You come along, you produce content about it. When you produce a show like like this one, and, and certainly like yours, which was one of the pioneering streaming shows, it's your stamp of quality, it's your personality, it's your uh, ideas. So uh, how daunting was it when you said, fuck it, I want to do this show live on three? Uh, it wasn't daunting at all because I had um, I had hundreds of episodes of experience on, with Epileptic Gaming. I mean, we were a weekly show, or excuse me, we were like a daily show for two years. Hmm. Um, I mean, no shit. Like, we did, I, I mean, I probably did more episodes of Epileptic Gaming than, I- than some of the current talents will ever do of the shows in their whole fucking life. So for me, it was almost like, well, I don't know, but when I la- relaunched Live on 3, I launched Live on 3, Epileptic Gaming, Call and Brawl, and I was also doing Weapon of Choice. So I was doing four shows. Like, if anything, I was like, fuck, man, the last four years just taught me how to run a daily show, how to manage it, how to script it, what content people like. I was like, I'm just going to multiply that times four and go with it. And eventually that did turn into, you know, one more game and... and mm this and that so i i mean i i give everything to to actually to ggl and and the opportunity to let me create a show like epileptic gaming that would basically condition me to do you know anything from that point forward Mm. well but but isn't it different i always feel when i watch live on three and this is no disrespect to your co-hosts especially the fluffy kitten who i'm a massive fan of um but uh i i feel the show kind of each episode kind of lives and dies on you like whether it's a good show or not seems to be about what kind of problems you faced before you go on air or how you're feeling how enthusiastic you are about the the guest or what's been happening in the current esports trend i I yeah. always feel that it's it's you know more so than any other show i've seen you in live on three is about dj week um, th- it's an interesting perspective, Richard, and and one that I can I can certainly take a step back and and uh, appreciate. Um, I I mean the the cold hard truth is that I'm not really happy with Live on Three right now. I think that when I reflect back on what it was when uh, when I first started, um, you know, and also you have to take into consideration that um, this was also during a time when. People thought esports might shrivel up and die. You know, like there was reason to talk about it because it was like, well, fuck. You know, like we gotta, you know, it's time for us to finally pull our pants up and and see what we can do about it from that, you know, from that side. It wasn't like a it wasn't like, oh well shit, there's 30 other esports shows out there. We we better hop on the bandwagon. Like we started live on three because that shit was dying. Or yeah. and it was not, you know. Um and when I compare that to what it is now, like, you know, I don't particularly like to go on every week and listen to Slasher Read News. Like, frankly, I, I'm torn between trying to figure out, 
you know, should we just only ever bring guests on? Like, do we even give a fuck what happened during the week in esports? Because I'm not sure. Like, it, do do we have a uh, an obligation to cover every single fucking headline that happened? Because, like you said, I I. I, it's hard for me to get interested in something that I'm not necessarily passionate about. Mm -hmm. And so when there's just something that's like, oh, you know, I don't know. Or I've talked about it five times during the week already. Like, it's, I feel like I'm my, my therapist right now. And I'm like, uh, no, you know, no, just letting this, it all out. This is what out, I was hoping for. This is great. This is exactly what I wanted to hear. So uh, I mean, I like, Scoots knows what I'm talking about. Like, Scoots made an exit probably for many of these same reasons. Like, you know, and and it's nothing against the show, the audience, slasher, and uh, and everything about how just I personally feel about it right now. Like, I again, I I know it has its place. I'm not convinced. I know what its role should be right now. What about uh, you know, kind of the 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 competition, so to speak. Do you ever look at anyone's shows and think, fuck, I wish I was doing that? Or do you ever look at anyone's shows and feel you're just doing what I was doing years ago? You know, we're no further forward. Of course. Of course. I mean, well, why well, wouldn't well, I? Yeah, okay. I mean, well, so give me, give me some I insight mean, into that. Well, I mean, of course, I, I like, I, I believe that it is fucking amazing that all of these shows exist. Mm -hmm. I believe that I can go back in history and pinpoint the fact that, you know, some of the content, in fact, a lot of the content that I've created, a lot of the initiatives that I've been involved in have spawned a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't look at it from an egotistical perspective. I look at it from an accomplished perspective. And for that reason, like, you know, I know a lot of people want to, well, gosh, you've got this show and you've got, um, you, you know, you've got the good show and live on three and this and that. And like, you know, whether these shows exist I'm going to do live on three and all my other shows and whether those shows exist, they're going to do all of their things. I'm happy to, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, to take responsibility for, I think, you know, having one of the first esports shows and, and coming up with, uh, some of the concepts of daily and weekly programming. Um, but I certainly don't look at it from a, like, well, fuck those guys. Like I was doing that like 10 years ago. No, uh, not at all. Uh, I, in fact, there's a lot of guys I learned from, right? Because that's how I grew up. Is like, we watched our competition. We were like, well, that's a pretty fucking good idea, man. Like we could either cry about it or we could just figure out how to make it better. And, you know, I think I, I think less about that now, um, than I, than I did in the past because I think the race is much tighter than it used to be, but I still, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I still appreciate the, the fact that people are coming up with new ideas and evolving their own content, etc. I think the measure of success has to be longevity, though. And uh, we see a lot of these shows. Uh, I think it was, uh, was it The Pulse most recently? Um, you know, they come around and then they, they stop. They, they manage to do a few shows. I mean, I was aware of that limitation myself. You know, that's why I wanted to keep it fortnightly or bi-weekly for uh, the countries that have never heard the word fortnight before. Um, <laughs> which, in serious, we found that out last, uh, mm -hmm. last episode. We, 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 we were pumping out. It's out every fortnight. People are like, what the fuck? a fortnight right? <laughs> so uh, yeah so bi-weekly okay bi-weekly but anyway uh you know and, and I, I i didn't want to put too much demand on myself on the on the production team on the guys on guests um you know and, and you see a lot of shows come and go right now you've been around for so long live on three was like what 156 are we at now or something 159 th 159, today 59 right so that's huge dude and uh, do, uh, do you feel that like people should worry kind of less about what goes into the show and, and and maybe how we can make it all bells and whistles and rather just actually be able to commit to 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 making something grow um from what you mean for just specifically from live on three or what no no, no. i mean like for, for everyone producing the show right now like should the oh. measure of success really be oh. longevity oh well honestly like with any good idea and um i i seriously like um, and also, I really feel like 
this is probably one area that my career could take a path in. But I, I, I now I literally have produced thousands of shows, whether it be you know under television, under uh, web TV, uh, you know under internet television, whatever. Um, I have a lot of experience in that realm. So one of the first things that I always uh, give in terms of advice to anyone who comes to me and is like, "Wheat, I'm, I'm making a show, and this is what I'm gonna do." Right? I'm like, "Great, I've got a lot of experience in this. Let me help you." I always look at their idea and say, okay, this idea, like all this stuff, it's fucking fantastic. Tell me what you're going to do for episode 74. <laughs> you know, and then, and then when they're like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, it says here that you're going to have five pros on every week. So tell me what you're going to do for week 74 when now you're on the 74th week of trying to get five pros on your show. Like people don't think about it from that perspective. So I think that yes, in some aspects you have to think about longevity because it really should be, uh, it really should be helpful in figuring out if what you're producing ha like has that lo longevity in terms of being on your 50th episode or, or whatever. Like, I mean, these are, these are things to think about. Yeah, definitely. Um, how do you feel about being involved with Twitch? Because I think Twitch has kind of really shifted the focus in the in the esports industry. Um, the the streaming revolution has been both good, uh, perhaps even great, but it's also brought some bad stuff with it. I, I feel it, like you... let's 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 be honest, Richard. The streaming uh, revolution has been nothing but fucking amazing. Okay, it's amazing. I mean, it but... is. You can you can see bad parts to it as well, can't you? Um, I mean, let's let's talk. What do you think the bad parts are? Like, if I say bad parts, I think bad parts are like dickheads getting people's IPs and and DDoSing them. Oh, we're I think definitely going to come bad, to that. You we're, know? Gonna, we're definitely going to come yeah. to that. I've got a separate question for DDoS. Okay, but uh, here's here's a bad thing uh, example. Um, for, right, when you give a lot of people the tools, um. Which in Twitch TV is an amazing, you know, toolkit uh, to be able to stream, to be able to broadcast, to be able to reach like-minded people. I generally think you get a saturation of mediocre content, and it becomes increasingly difficult to sift through and find what's good and what's not. Um, so that's that's one thing I think is, is potentially bad about it. Uh, I mean, th there's others, but obviously I, I don't I'm know if you've got any thoughts. I'm so about glad that you brought this up. There we go. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really you, glad that you brought this up because so, I think that there is a fine parallel that we can compare mm -hmm. uh, and look at, and that's YouTube. Mm -hmm. Let's look at YouTube, and if you look at what it was, it was people uploading videos, small videos, and then and then eventually larger videos, and it was certainly its own video revolution, mm -hmm. and eventually it started to give out partnerships. And people realized that they could start making money. And then YouTube was like, okay, this is working out pretty good. Let's get more partnerships in. Something that is obviously, this is ringing very similar to like Twitch, Twitch uh, uh, upbringing. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, you know, similar stuff starts happening. It's like, wow, there's, there's a lot of people uploading videos to YouTube now. Holy, holy shit. And God, some of it's pretty bad. Like... You know, so what's happening is the good content are, you know, and that's totally, we can argue about what is actually good because I've seen some popular YouTube content that makes me go, what the fuck? Yeah, that's true. What happens is that the good content starts to go up and all the other stuff, it does go down. And you know what? It still exists in a way that people can still share their content and share their content. Mm -hmm. But really, it is, you know, of course, these guys that are able to maybe make a living off of it. And overall, as far as the saturation is concerned, like ultimately the audience dictates it because the numbers don't necessarily lie. Yeah. And I, I kind of I kind of agree on the one hand, but then I see great content being produced regularly um, by people that maybe don't get the kind of. Uh, plaudits that they deserve. Chris Chan, who does Climb in the Ladder, great example, I think. Um, you know, some of his shows, they're incredible. They got great content. They're ahead of the curve. They, they 
nip in uh, ahead of their rivals to talk about some things. Totally agree. Uh, and yet, you know, you watch it live, 300 viewers, you'll see a VOD, maybe gets 3,000 views. And then where it becomes particularly difficult, I, I would say, to kind of justify the numbers dictating what's good is when you see, I don't know, here's a video of uh, Idra calling someone a noob and it's got 120,000. And it's like, you know, did, did, at what point do we kind of need to say the community, there needs to be more kind of tools, I would say, to kind of get better content out. And then people are going to say, oh, you're being like a fascist, Richard, because you're saying, well, I, I, no, you're I mean, I, what's good and what, what isn't. But, you know, like, I'm trying I do to... agree from one, from one perspective, like I wish that discovery was better. Right. Like, I, and I don't know, I, I don't know exactly the key to discovery. I think in live streaming, it is a, a much more difficult thing. You know, it's different than a trend. Like, oh shit, this video has been viewed a lot. Like, quick, quick, push it to the front page. Like, that's easy. That's, that's like lazy, you know, trending. Um, so, you know, discovery, like, isn't that partially the audience's fault? Yeah, I think it is. But equally, um, I mean, it's, like, it's, but so. But how do you how do you fix that? Because I I don't know like. Well, I don't I don't either. But uh, I think I think esports is like a fucking fireworks display, like at the moment. Like if if there's a crowd of people standing totally. around staring at something and going ooh ah, oh, more people yeah, will come and just join, oh. right? They they, they oh, just god yes, and the god, crowd yes. just gets bigger and bigger and it snowballs and no one really fucking knows why. No, everyone stood there and and you know they could be watching yeah. something better just around the corner. Like there's a fucking laser show. But you'd never see it because, you know, you're still looking at exploding colors or whatever the fuck. So, well, I, 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 you know, I think uh, I think for someone me, someone in chat says, is that a bad thing? No, I, I don't know if it is a bad thing, but I, I, I do don't know, know either. It's different. I, I, I don't share that frustration anymore because I know I'm always going to be that guy. That's me. I'm fucked for life. I'm that guy. I'm the guy who says Root shouldn't have a game in house. And it's just an opinion. And but but fuck that guy for saying it, right? And that's me. That's my sure. login esports, right? You hate fireworks. Yeah, it, and I hate fireworks. So ever has been, right? <laughs> fuck fireworks. That, that's the new hashtag. <laughs> fuck fireworks. But uh, you know, uh, but I I think it is. It must be massively frustrating for people that work so hard to produce great content, and when they don't get the viewing numbers and the acclaim or the rewards, they're going to stop doing it. And esports becomes a worse place for that. Not everyone has your resilience, is what I'm saying, Marcus. Well, you know what? I don't know that many people want my resilience because there's part of me that feels I should give it up a long time ago. No, in all seriousness, um, I, you know, I just, I wish I knew. Like, I, I wish I, I, I knew. I do think that Twitch does have a job in that because that was, you know, the original question, I guess, all about, you know, Twitch. And by the way, I love my job there. I, I believe in it uh, a lot. But I do think that Twitch has a job to do there in terms of discovery. And I'm not sure what the solution is. Like, you know, um, I, I really... I, I don't know. I don't know if it is even something on Twitch. I don't know if it's an external, like, you know, if this is truly our TV, where's the eSports TV guide? Like, I, I don't know. You know, maybe maybe we need that. How come mm -hmm. you know, people are always looking for new content created? Where's the content that reviews other people's content? You know, like, that's the easiest low-hanging fruit that exists out there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think it's a combination of all these things. But I'll tell you one thing. I do firmly believe that those guys that put forth that effort can really um, still benefit from it. Look at Mr. Bitter, for example. His his uh, 12 weeks with the pro was never like the biggest thing to happen in StarCraft in terms of stream numbers, but is consistent. People liked it. They watched the VODs. It was talked about. You know, shit, man, I see more Chan Man V threads than I see any One More Game TV threads on Reddit. So something else has to be wrong if that, you know, if that, like, I don't, I'm indifferent about it being on there because I do believe the fans will just watch it and, and you know, find it either way. I think that it, I want to see more stuff like Chan Man, et cetera, because that's where I probably would get more exposed to new shows. Definitely not through, because my viewing habits are my viewing habits. And I'm guessing that everyone else is about the same way. The other you know, thing you know, is... Sorry, the other thing I think Twitch has done as well, which is interesting, and I definitely want your opinion on this, and I'm, co I'm conscious of time. Um, so, right, because of the streaming revolution and because of Twitch TV, uh, I think people in eSports have become less focused about mainstream and trying to get on television. 
Uh, whereas back in the days, as you well know, we were both there with CGS. Um, television was, we thought the fucking, yeah, <laughs> television we thought was the fucking holy grail. Like television was going to save us all. It was going to give us jobs. It was going to legitimize the industry. And now that's completely off the fucking table. So uh, the question I, I guess would be is, is that a good thing that Twitch has kind of broadened our horizons or changed our goals, however you want to word it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as someone who's worked in television, we don't want any part of that. Yeah. We don't want modified rules. Um, we don't want forced post-produced content. Right now, we have a level of freedom that very few mediums have ever been able to truly experience and thrive off of. Mm -hmm. We should be celebrating the living shit out of that because it's true. You know, look at how many regulated mediums there are out there. And we are in the one where we can be ourselves. We can entertain how we want to entertain. We can do the content we want to do. We can run the tournaments that we want to tournament uh, or that we want to run. And we don't have to adhere to anyone else's rules in terms of when you can run commercials or this and that. We make it ourselves. Like this is something new. This is this is essentially uncharted territory that I think um, you know we should all be very happy to be to be in. So yeah, I I think it's fantastic that we don't have to look that way. And you know I do think that Twitch also has a level of timing in its success. Like, you know, like even if you'd offset the creation of live streaming by two years, you know, would Street Fighter 4 have gotten as popular? Would StarCraft 2 and League of Legends gotten as popular if Twitch didn't really come to, uh, you know, until 2011? I don't I don't know if anyone can ever answer that. But same thing would be to say, well, what if Twitch came even two years before that? Would that mean that Counter-Strike would be the super hot shit because it was the <laughs> game at the time? It's, it's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm. All right, well, my last question before we toss you back over to James and then let you go. Uh, how was the school play, by the way? Was it good? Oh, it was fantastic. James was the narrator, and last night we went over cadence on a couple of parts. I got to tell you, man, he, he can pick it up pretty quick. He, he still went pretty fast, but there's a couple parts we worked on specifically for dramatic effect and, and comedic effect. Brilliant. Good job, Jammers. You did. Personal coaching from DJ Wheat. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, but my, my final question was just, uh, I mean, look, you've been doing this a long, long, long time. You continue to have a prolific output. Um, you've been involved in every major esports title in some form or another, whether it was back uh, when, as you rightly say, it was Quake, or to you being trotted out to apologize to the world on behalf of Riot Games, uh, which I'm just going to mention again because uh, I'm an asshole. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when highlight when, of my career, man. One no, of I, I, I'm sure it was. Um, when do you think enough is going to be enough for you, and maybe you're going to, you know, use this as the stepping stone that maybe it was, and and we're going to see you commentating on an MLS soccer game or or something <laughs> else. Um, I don't, I don't know. I to be co totally honest with you, I haven't really thought about it that much. Like. I'm sure there will be a time where relevance begins to fade away. Who knows? Like, gamers are still getting older. A lot of the guys that grew up with me in Quake that, you know, look at the StarCraft II audience that is generally considered a, a little bit older, like, it might just be an industry that grows in that way. Mm -hmm. If that happens, great. Um, you know, where I could see myself going to still stay within the community is, uh, or within this space, is... You know, a complete behind-the-scenes production. Um, uh, uh, you know, like, for example, if I was just going to, like, hang it all up and just go behind the scenes, I would absolutely go knock on Riot's door. Uh, I think that they've got some amazing guys over there I would love to work with. Like, that would be a facet I would love to do. But also, like, just maybe consulting and trying to help people with their careers, with, uh, you know, with guidance. And I think there's a lot of people right now that, really uh, aspire to, to try to make a difference or do something or find that job but just don't really know how to do it. Mm. But all that, all that aside, like, I'm, I don't know. I really honestly don't know. I don't see myself really ever stop playing games, and uh, that's the most important part of my job and sort of every, you know, facet that I, I deal with it. So 
Um, the other thing too is obviously I love Twitch, and I could see myself, you know, with Twitch for as long as I could possibly be there, um, because I do find that side of it incredibly fascinating as well. So. I, I wish I had a better answer, Richard. I don't really oh, have that fine. much of a life plan. I take it kind of <laughs> like day by day. Um, but, I mean, certainly I will probably be uh, doing a little bit less commentating, okay. you know, overall going forward. Like, I'm, I'm married. I have a kid, right? Like, I can't just be doing international trips every other fucking week. I can't do it anymore. It's not fair to myself, my family, um, and, and I don't need to. Like, if I was in a situation that I needed to, I would. But, um, you know, I'm sure there are times I miss it, but uh, it's kind of nice to just be at home, too. Yeah. So, so I'm going to throw you over to James, but just one last thing. Sure. Do, do you feel uh, that, we, uh, that you have a successor? <laughs> like if you were to retire tomorrow, would you, would you have uh, someone who's going to take over and be the new DJ Wheat? Um, uh, I, I don't know. I really, I don't know. There, from a commentating standpoint, I actually do. Mm. But from a, you know, guy that's sort of willing to maybe go to bat for just about, you know, just gaming in general, whether that esports or competitive gaming, and you know, we didn't really talk about it much, but at Twitch, one of my big jobs is is like mobile gaming initiatives and stuff, and I love that shit to death. I just, I can't get enough of it. Um, I don't know. I, I, that person's out there and we'll, we'll find them. But, uh, uh, I, I, as far as the caster goes, I, I, I absolutely have the biggest man crush on Jat, uh, Riot <laughs> Jat. I, I, I cannot like say it enough. I feel like I'm going to send him flowers one of these times. He's just really fucking intelligent. Yeah, he and is a he's charmer. one of the few guys where it's like every, Everything that comes out of his mouth has purpose and meaning and reason, and I love him for it. And um, he's he's great. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan of Jack. I've just had the, the producer in my ear as well who said that we've lost James. Uh -oh. So uh, just momentarily, it wouldn't be a, a eSports Heaven show if something didn't go wrong on the fly. Although we've, we've yet I to be that. DDoSed. We've yet to be DDoSed. Which we didn't even talk about that. So oh. fuck it. Fuck, fuck your questions, viewers. Uh, DDoSing, man. Like... Right. How does it feel to be this great dude producing, you know, th this great content, and yet there it is. Every week, someone's trying to fuck with your shit, man. Um, it's frustrating, but I've just I've gotten to the point now where um, I'm ready to just flip the switch. In terms of like, um. I, I mean, like, I've done what I can do to protect myself. And if it happens, then it happens. And, and we'll try again next week. But, it, you know, like, it sucks. You know, what do you want me to say? Like, other than, um, yeah, I would, like to, I would like to shoot my arms through my monitor and grab their fucking <laughs> necks and, and, you know, like, rub their faces in my own shit and, and be like, why would you ever do something like that? But, um you know, it's it, it, I I don't know. I just I can't really get angry about it anymore because it's just like there's nothing that that I can I can do about it. I think it's sad as shit right now. I am weeping tears of of just unhappiness for Dota and the fact that all of these qualifiers and all these teams have been stricken with this kind of crap like it just pisses me off. It really uh makes me angry but I'm pretty docile. Uh, why, and, and, yeah, why, so, why do so. you think that we can't get beyond the DDoS? Why is it in esports that we're all so fucking... We're still you know, under the tyranny of some spotty little virgin with a botnet. I mean, like, what does that say about our industry? I think it says something about the internet uh, and, and just that mentality in general. I don't think it says anything about this industry... I think it just says that the industry is fragile in ways that maybe people would have never predicted. You know, hacking, BAC, DDoSing, like this is all kind of stuff that you're going to sort of expect to deal with. But I think that the fact that it has become easier to do and um, that people sort of get off on, uh, on sort of ruining, you know, I mean, because that's what it is. I don't know why else they'd want to do it, uh, like ruining people's revenue opportunities and or just you know, whatever they're doing, their content. 
it just you know it just says a lot about that particular group of people, and I don't even know what that is other than fuck them. I I I don't know. I like I literally, I wish Skype would do something about it. I in fact I was even telling Slasher today. I was like Slasher, fucking Skype said that the Xbox One is uh, is going to have uh, Skype or excuse me Microsoft said the Xbox One is going to have Skype. I'm like so I'm thinking when it comes out. I'm actually going to start DDoSing people. I'm going to start DDoSing <laughs> all the fucking major C and see how they feel about it when people are like, yo, I'm getting DDoSed because of Skype and people are getting my IP and what are you going to fucking do about it? Maybe then they'll listen. But right now they're not. But they they are like yesterday I got to watch them reveal and now we've got a complete intrusion potential in your living room with the, you know, with Skype on Xbox uh, well, it's going to be amazing. Like, seriously, it will be amazing. If people thought they weren't protected before, oh, just you wait. Just you wait. All right, James, uh, quickly before I let Marcus go, uh, have we got any good questions? Uh, yeah. In, in, um, on Twitter. Adam Sullivan, um, in relation to what you were saying about epileptic gaming earlier, is a big fan, apparently. He's <laughs> watching right now, and apparently he called in several times. He was saying, would you ever revive it? Incidentally, Marcus, uh, I know Adam, great guy. He used to work at Amiga Sector, where we hosted the EU CGS. He was, uh, he's a longtime fan, man. Yeah, he's, um, he's, a, he's a great guy. He is one it? of these guys that probably has a reminder on his Google Calendar to email me or tweet me or figure out a way to ask me this question about every other month, and I love him uh, for it. Um, that would you know, be original the, here with the questions. Then. The, no, it's, 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 uh, it's an okay question because I get it. The, the, uh, the most requested show to come back, you guys, is, is Epileptic Gaming. Um, and it has a fan base that spans over, you know, 11 years. And, and we had different hosts through those years and different versions of it. And I, I completely understand that. So, um, you know, Epileptic Gaming is the, is the show that I want to bring back more than anyone else. But I, it means so much to me that I just refuse to do it unless I feel like I'm going to be able to do the show justice. And I hope that fans will, like, realize and appreciate that is that, I, I could do it half-assed, but I don't want to do it half-assed. Like that that show means more to me than all of the other shows combined that I that I do that are on one more game. So um, it, it's really just it 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 is that perfectionist in me that yeah. uh, is probably the biggest hurdle for the show. But I I do believe uh, in my heart of hearts that show will come back. Great, that's good. Good to hear. Yeah, that's good news. Um, uh, we got any others? Yeah, there's um. Someone asked, most events still have a lot of downtime. And this was from Marcus Helwich on Twitter. Um, a lot of events, a lot of shows have a lot of downtime in between games and things like that. Um, they, use, they tend to use it badly. They, they tend to use that time badly. Um, what's your take on that? Do you, think, do you think that time is okay? Do you think that's okay? Do you think, oh, that's, that's advertising time? Or, you know, or do you think we should be constantly having presenters on, on screen? Um, I do, I do like, uh, I do like content, right? Like I don't necessarily like to, Hey, keep it on the desk for 20 minutes. Have these guys talk about fucking anything and everything. Just throw random words in their ears and let them in. I'm not a big fan of that. Like sometimes it's okay. Like sometimes it can work and it can be really good. Um, but actually it's funny you mention that because right after the last MLG, um, and this criticism came from them. I actually emailed Ryan Thompson over there with a segment idea and said, hey, I would love to do this whenever there is downtime. And I don't want to reveal what it is because I'm hoping that we actually still do it. But I do think that there uh, is more to be done there. You know, we talked about the improvements earlier. We talked about, like, in the world of, of competing to have the best production, wouldn't you think this would be by far one of the most, like, focused on areas than any other area because everyone is like, oh, God, Spinny logo, fuck, shoot me now. Oh, God, dubstep song, holy shit. <laughs> you know, it, the person who's like, we can fill an hour of that through the day, is they're going to earn a lot of brownie points. They'll earn a lot of brownie points. So it's something to think about. You know, I, I, I yeah. don't think it's a bad thing. Like, yeah, it annoys me. I'll turn the channel temporarily. Um, what do you think that, that, that's it, isn't it? You lose so many viewers in that downtime, surely. Like, if you're a content creator, you want to have stuff that's well, watchable you know instead what? of a logo. Like, here's an amazing concept. As we were talking about, you know, 
you know, Richard talking about content that doesn't get as much, you know, as much viewership or, or as much exposure, you know, why can't there be maybe a mini five minute to 10 minute segment of Chan Man V show that he could submit to MLG and they could play it there. And maybe, maybe someone could take a, a, a segment from live on three or something. And yeah, you know, I mean like really it's not fucking rocket science. If someone wanted to put forth the effort, this would be one way, one way to do it, but you know, there, there you go, just throwing it out there. That yeah, would be a great way to fill that content, and, and and solve the problem of exposing, you know, some of these shows and stuff. Yeah, we're well, talking about exposing shows. We were talking earlier about Twitch and you know the the, the plethora of kind of shows that are out there and the quality of some of them. Do you think that? And this was suggested by Perilous Gaming on Twitter. That do you think that the streams could be categorized better instead of just like on twitch it's just games basically categorized by games you think it would be ca categorized by coverage talk shows tournaments uh, or practice streams for instance if it's just yeah team practicing do you think that kind of categorization needs to be there to help i i do i kind of i'm i'm definitely in the family uh on the twitch side that's like i would love another layer of categor categorization and also um, like a more general element, you know, like if, if this extra layer existed, you know, I could put myself to a, uh, to a specific game, but like right now, you know, it's kind of funny because, uh, live on three is a general esports show. Uh, we set, you know, the, the game according to kind of what we're doing, but for the most time part, we, we kind of just stay under one category. Like it seems to me like it would be cool and maybe discovery would be better if there was a talk show section that then also had yeah. a talk show VODs or something like that or tournament. So yeah, I do wish there was like one additional layer underneath it. And, uh, you know, I can't really speak to whether or not anything like that is, is coming, but I know that as Twitch is growing and as the, the whole concept of discovery continues to be a hot item, like certainly those types of things are taken into consideration. Yeah, I think that would help. Yeah, that's pretty much well. Also, I, I forget who said it in chat, so I apologize to the person who said it, but someone, um, we're talking about how to get more content out there, great content. Someone said cooking with DJ Wheat should be <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that one. No. Maybe we could pick some other things, but not, not <laughs> cooking. I do make a mean omelet. I make a really People mean see omelet. That. That's what gets the views. According to my wife and my son, I make the best omelets in the world. I'm just saying. Just oh, there you are. Omelets with DJ Wheat is the, yeah. what we should and, limit it. And egg white only omelets. Of, of course. That goes, that yes. goes without saying. Yes. Uh, there was one other serious question, and then we're going to let you go, Marcus. Uh, All it's, right. It, it's a nice and easy one. Uh, it was, uh, would you ever cast a CSGO game? And obviously, we've got a lot of Counter-Strike people that follow through Cad Red and that. So will you come back now that CSGO isn't terrible? Um, I, I, would, I would like to. Uh, I'm not sure in what capacity I would ever do it. Um, if, you know, if someone came to me and said, hey, you know, let, give this a, a go, I, I, would definitely, I would definitely consider it. I mean, needless to say, I've, I've certainly watched quite a bit. There's a few guys out there that are doing great uh, themselves. But, uh, I, I, I mean, the answer is yes. Given the opportunity, uh, you'll, you definitely will not die before seeing myself do a, a CSGO match for sure. There we go. Great. That's all we needed. Several exclusives tonight. Marcus, again, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. Thanks, I know as guys. well you've got your own show to be producing, and I would urge everybody, if you want to see, if you haven't already, which I can't believe if you're watching this, but just in case, uh, do tune in to uh, Live on 3. Marcus, plug it. Tell them how they can do that. Uh, yeah, they could just go to twitch.tv slash TV. We run uh, three shows uh, every week at the moment, Kings of Tin. Uh, inside the game and then live on three, which is tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, as always. And then also, I've been streaming a lot more, which I have to say, guys, it's been really zen and sort of enjoyable. Uh, so uh, that's just at twitch.tv slash DJweed. I've just been playing some Quake Live, which is a lot of fun because I've been playing with viewers. And then also uh, just laddering StarCraft II, some occasional League of Legends, etc. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, like I said, just how relaxing that can actually be. Uh, even though some videos might say otherwise. So I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Uh, and if you can uh, tune in to Live on 3 tonight, please check it out. 
Right, Marcus, I will, I will let you go. Uh, again, absolute pleasure to have your insight. I need to remember, you're the kind of guest I can book for two hours, seriously. I, I felt there was so much more we could have gone into. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to do it again in the future, brother. All right, man. Take care. All right, thanks a lot. And to all you people out there who are staying with us, right, what have we got for you after the break? Well, we've talked about the good side. Of course, DJ Wheat represents all that is good and great in uh, streaming and content production. But a man who also is good and great is JP McDaniel. However, he's had his ups and downs with the community. He's even took shit from yours truly over the title Real Talk. We're definitely going to get into that. I, I owe him an apology, uh, definitely for anyone who saw the Idra interview. Um, and we're going to be going into that after the, for this five-minute break where we're going to run some lovely commercials to support Streamgasm, who produce this show. All right, I'll see you after the break. Peace.
And welcome back. So as one luminary leaves us, we've got another one for you. But uh, just before we come to that, uh, we are going to plug the hashtag properly this time. We have got a question of the day. How can esports streams improve? Uh, we haven't really pushed the question of the day. I would love to get your thoughts on it. Please send them in and James will uh, be reading all the tweets that you send. And you can do that with the hashtag esports heaven we are reading the twitch tv chat god help us for doing that and uh, we are as well keeping up on the team liquid stream the cad red stream the tech nine stream reddit streams uh, threads i mean not streams all the, you know you know what i mean we're basically paying attention so right who have we got for you next and we're in the hell section and perhaps this is a little bit unfair but uh, you're going to see why. It's not a reflection of him. Uh, it's a man who has pioneered StarCraft content, uh, a man who has done so much to, uh, I would say, change uh, our ideas about what uh, what can be done with video content, and someone that I've given a hard time in the past, which uh, we're going to talk about first and foremost, but it is, of course, JP McDaniel. JP, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you uh, for bringing me on the show, man. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm glad you're glad. Uh, first thing, and this needs to be fucking said, uh, just a great job on the Idrit interview. It's got nothing to do with any of the questions I'm going to ask you or anything, but I just want to say, you went out there and got the interview everyone wanted, and uh, people said, oh, there was easy questions. Bullshit. Don't listen to them. They don't know what they're fucking talking about. <laughs> you fucking nailed that shit. So uh, I just well, want to say, you. well done. Thank you. Thank you. That, that interview kind of fell into my lap, oddly enough. It, yeah. I, Greg's my friend, first and foremost, and as it happened on State of the Game, I was like, if you need to talk not on a show and just like bounce ideas off of someone, feel free. And a couple hours later, he was like, hey, do you, do you mind if I come on a real talk? And like, obviously, I'm not going to be like, no, I don't want you to come on my show. So <laughs> I was like, if this is really what you want to do, like, I really think you should take the weekend and think about it for 48 hours and make the right decision. And mm. he's like, I don't really need to think. Let's just go ahead and do it. So I wasn't going to say no. And, and I'm glad that I didn't. In retrospect, I thought it went really well. And I, even though we're going to come up in a second, I also want to say I've, I've, I've ripped on you in the past for the real talk thing. And uh, I just want to say as well, we, we were joking about it before. That isn't necessarily a, f a reflection on what you do. It's more just about me being a real prick. You know, like that's, that's, <laughs> that's the, what we've come up with. Hashtag real pricks. I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, and I'm just a harsh, nasty man on the internet. No problem, man. The name is kind of silly. But I, I hope that people see the name as a silly one rather than like, that's what they're going to expect from the show. Yeah, I, I know. I try I, to get that, but at the end of the day, I can't bring someone on an interview and, and ask them the hardest question in the world and not like prompt them for it, yeah. you know, ahead of time. Because I don't know. To me, that just is, is not the best thing to do. So it's it's ambush. Kind of it it, it's like what I'm going to do to you now. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean that that's Which fine sucks. with me, man. That's fine with me. For for people that aren't trained for it or that haven't been on talk shows before, it's it's really tough to be in that position. So I, I kind of recognize that, but. I'm all for it. Let's go, Richard. All right, let's do it then. Well, first question. Uh, how do you feel right now about um, the kind of community and, and how your content, given everything you've done for, uh, for StarCraft II, has kind of been received? I, I've seen you make some comments on Reddit, um, you know, where you're, you, you've become really jaded. Um, you found, found it hard to stay motivated. You've been kind of a little bit down, you know, downbeat about uh, wanting to continue doing it. So uh, this is why you're in the hell section, because I, I've seen you do all this great work, and I know it seems that the community's got to you a little bit. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, it hasn't happened so much as of late. Um, a lot of it was when I was just commentating, and it was, it was being in a position that I wasn't 100% comfortable with, but I was, I was enjoying doing it, because who doesn't love casting a BlizzCon? I mean, for me, that was probably one of the like, highlights of my career. And then... Mm to finish the cast and go look at Reddit and see the number one post on the entire website of Reddit be something to the effect of, like, why is JP casting BlizzCon? Like, that's a little bit demoralizing, a little mm -hmm. bit like, well, fuck those guys. And I definitely said that uh, publicly. Like, I, there's countless posts of me just, like, ripping into people. And that was probably just because at the time I was very heated. And I've gotten better about it in the past couple of months, you know, I'll, I'll type something out that's very passive aggressive and, and to post on Twitter, on Reddit, and I'll read it and then just delete it and like go on with my life. And, and I think that I've just kind of grown in that regard. But in the past, like they've definitely gotten to me. I mean, like I said, I think there's a post on Team Liquid where I call 
pretty much everyone that listens to State of the Game, like ungrateful fucks or something like that. I pulled an Edra and used and called them all fucks <laughs> before he even did it. So, um, so you're I, the proto Edra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've definitely like had my fair share of of shitting on the community before, but. At the end of the day, like if it wasn't for the community, I wouldn't be here. And, and I recognize that every day, and I did then. It's just that I was in a very, very pissed off mood when I wrote all of those, uh, all of those comments. And, and hopefully, people can recognize that. Um, talk about how hard it is then, because how much of yourself do you put into this? I mean, like we, we we've talked about, you know, Marcus earlier in the show, and and he was like, yeah, man, I get up. It's seven days a week. I used to love it for Quake. I treat it, and I'm still got that energy, that enthusiasm. What about your approach to it? Because you know, I, I've seen so much content c coming from you. You must work really hard at it. So, give us give us an idea of uh, how much of your time it consumes. Sure. I mean, so th this is like my life. I, I went to college and during college it was even my full-time full -time job where I was leaving on a, a Thursday or Friday and getting home on a Monday morning at 4 a.m., taking the red eye home and then taking a final exam at 7 a.m. So I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and, and now being out of college for several years, it's, it's seven days a week. Uh, I usually tr I try to take a day off, but most of the time, I'll just end up streaming anyways, whether it's just streaming some random game or something like that. Um, Content-wise, it, it's definitely been a little bit less than it, than it normally is. Um, I've, I've found that there is a very weird line uh, when it comes to creating content that you can't be live 24-7, mm -hmm. but you have to be live like almost 24-7. Like, you have to have some deal of being there but not being there, it, it, it's, I don't know how to describe it, but like, yeah. you have to have some reason for people to tune into your show without being there all the time. And, and I, I've gotten kind of back to being there all the time the past couple of weeks with just all of the, the Blizzard employees that we've had on the shows and then the whole Idra thing breaking on State of the Game and two days later being uh, on Real Talk. And, and I don't like to do that. I don't like to kind of crowd everything because I think at one point, like six of the 25 top posts on Reddit SC had to do with State of the Game or JP in some way. And, and I don't like that. I don't like that amount of attention, um, mm. regardless if it's good for my career or whatnot. I, I'd rather kind of be in the, in the shadows. And that's why after I why? finished casting, I was just... Why? I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to force you off on a tangent. What, why don't you want that level of attention? I'd find that quite... I'd probably um, enjoy that, I think. I mean, I, I enjoy the... Uh, I enjoy it, but it, it's that... I don't like, I, I feel like, and, and this is something that uh, my, my friend Day9 and me have always said, and it's something that he posted on Reddit recently, where a lot of the people in the community treat us like characters in a book, where we are this personality, we have this amount of personality traits to us, and we cannot change on any given basis. Like, perfect example is like, there's Day9, and then there's Sean. And mm. people say that and say like, he has this dual personality when it's actually pretty much like the same person but he just has different aspects to him or mm -hmm. like if he's on a live show he's got to be on he's got to be funny he's got to be energetic and then when he's not on a live show like he can do whatever he wants and and people are very reluctant to give that um leeway to people like mm -hmm. you're either this or you aren't is kind of how the community responds to that and and i don't like that i don't like being in the limelight and and people thinking that i am this certain way and then being judged on that constantly. Like, I used to read Reddit comments pretty much every single day when I was a caster, and that was probably to my own discredit. Like, mm. it sucks being told that you're shit every hour of the day. And I was like, oh, well, that guy thinks I'm shit, but he doesn't say why. So I guess it must be true. And now I'm like, well, that guy thinks he's, I'm shit, but he doesn't say why. So fuck him, and let's just go to the next comment, right? Um, and, and it's just a growing process. Like. Back then, I knew that, but I didn't actually like act on it. And now mm -hmm. I'm just like I act on it a little bit better than I do, or than I did then. So sorry, you were you were going somewhere. You were you were talking about you know kind of your uh, your, your progress and, and and where you were heading. So uh, with uh, with with your kind of career and how you got to where you are producing all this content. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think just to to kind of sum all that up, like mm. I, I basically the past. In December, January-ish, like, I just took a break. And at one point, I was actually just like, you know what? Maybe I should just stop doing all this and go do something else. And then I was like, well, I don't know what that something else is, and I don't know if there is actually something else that I would enjoy or, or be passionate about in life. Because if I'm not, like, passionate about something, I do not 
care about it whatsoever. I, I could give two shits about it. So mm. eventually I was just like, well, let's just start doing this again and state of the game become more regular. Real talk is kind of on a hiatus, but it, it comes out every now and then, especially like with the, the uh, Idra episode. And um, I got lucky doing another show called Role Play, which is basically just live streaming Dungeons and Dragons. There's no like set up to that. We just play the game and that's done really well. Um, and, and now I'm just kind of starting to add on more projects that are a little bit, need more resources than a state mm. of the game where it's just a couple of webcams and some graphics. It's having some stuff built into like custom HTML5 websites and, and using some of that stuff. Kind of like, kind of like stuff that I could do in a studio if I had a full on team, but trying to do it all myself. And we'll see how that goes. That it, it's really labor intensive to host a show if you have to do all the switching yourself. But I think really the only, I think like three people do it where it's me, Marcus, and Chan Man, from what I can tell, like, um, as far as I know, everyone else kind of has a producer doing the things on the side, which is 100% the way to do it. Like, if you can do that, do it no matter what, because it is a complete clusterfuck if you're doing it yourself. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you, and this is one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to talk to you about, um, and that is basically, do you ever feel overlooked as a, a pioneer? Because I don't think we can underestimate the importance of uh, State of the Game and, and what it did for the StarCraft II competitive community um, and what it did for kind of esports broadcasting as a whole. Uh, it's a show that I see now. I, I think it's often been imitated, but maybe never bettered. Um, and yet, I, I don't know, when, when people talk about JP and, and JP-related content, I don't know, so, some, some of the stuff that came after seems to get a lot more of the, the plaudits. I mean, did, did you have any thoughts about that or any feelings? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the question was just like, how do I feel about people... Yeah. Shitting on me more than than praising me is that kind well, of what no, you're no, 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 not not kind of. I mean, I guess it's about your place, particularly within esports and people's perception of you. I mean, because that is a pioneering piece of content. Uh, that it's it's not you're not wrong to use the word pioneering for it. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, like, I I feel like I have a hard time kind of with my ego sometimes, where it gets way too blown out of proportion, like it just gets way too big. And thankfully, all of that has been kind of uh, inside of me, not out there in the public eye, and, and I've been able to back that off a lot. Um, I feel like State of the Game was just the first at what it did, um, yep. and, and that's part of the reason why it was so successful, and uh, it was one of the times where I was starting at MLG as, kind of, uh, as a volunteer person and kind of started the whole StarCraft thing over there uh, with Day 9, so it was a little bit of luck and, and a little bit of just being the first on the scene. Um, and and Back when I started then, I didn't know a single person within StarCraft II. I mean, I, I played StarCraft I as a, as a kid. Um, I knew about all of these uh, huge people like uh, Gurr from XDs and Slush, and uh, I knew in control, I knew who Idra was, I knew who Artosis and Tasteless, and, and Day9 was doing his show back then, kind of just getting started. This was pre-100, episode 100, for the Daily. And I was just like, hey, we should, we should do a podcast, because prior to that... Um, which is actually right around the time that Marcus, because I was listening to the, the segment prior to this, mm. uh, started Live on 3 when he was at CGS. I started a podcast for uh, World of Warcraft called ArenaCast, which was probably the biggest one for that. And it was ironic, or not ironic, it was just funny, because I always felt like Marcus like looked down upon me for that <laughs> for the entire time, because no one enjoyed WoW Esports. Even the people that were probably in it didn't enjoy it as much as that everyone else thought. But no. Nah. It was just kind of being the first to do it. I'd always wanted to do a podcast because I was such a big fan of just general gaming uh, shows uh, like GFW Radio, for those that have uh, watched that. Uh, it's an American show that no longer exists. And I just wanted to do something like that. So luckily, I was the first to do it. And, and luckily, I had the right people on there. And luckily, it grew and, and made my career what it is today. How do you feel about imitators? And when you see things, you know, state of the league, you know, things like that for, for LOL or... Um, other shows that have come along and, and, and kind of, they have that state of the game feel, but they're called something right. else. I mean, imitation is the best form of, of flattery is, is really the, the way to approach that, I think. Uh, Travis, the creator and host of State of the League at uh, BlizzCon like two years ago, 
um, I had heard about it and I'd kind of laughed at the name and he came up to me and asked like, are you, are you okay with me using the name? And I was like, yeah, that's, that's fine. I was probably drunk at the time, but I told him, <laughs> yes, I probably shouldn't have. Um, and he actually did a show, uh, a couple months ago, uh, with Marn called like real talk with Marn. And I just, I, I just tweeted, I'm like, are you really making another show? Like with the exact same name that I'm already using for a show. And he quickly fixed that. So in terms of the, the imitators, like, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. Like, I, I'm not, I don't have a big enough ego where it's just like, well, screw all those other shows. Like, what do they think they're doing? I'm the, I'm the best at state of the game. Like, I don't care. That, that's fine with me. It's, it's more competition. I think competition only drives uh, you to make better things in the long run. So, Well, how do you feel about IP kind of, uh, you know, and, and how we protect that within these streaming shows? And is, is there a way that we can do it? Because I think all, all streaming content itself is kind of derivative we uh, emulate uh, sports shows, for example. Right. You know, it's, we're all looking to be like the ESPN of esports. That's pretty much the the goal. I think everyone uh, aspires to be, uh, whether you're a news website or a content producer. But um, you know, uh, is it therefore can, can we say when we see people copying our ideas, like, hang on a minute, you know, I'm, I, this is unacceptable. You know, I, I've kind of pioneered, yeah. pioneered this. It, it's kind of funny because. Esports for the longest time has been really unprofessional when it comes to contracts and uh, IP and, and ownership and trademarking and all that. Like, I've actually just now recently started getting into that when I should have done that from the very start. Like, um, I, I don't think there's any actual legal action that you can take on any of this, and I don't think I ever would because it's just be a waste of money for all involved when we don't really all have that much money to begin with. Um, but it, it's definitely something that needs to, behind the scenes, be uh, looked at and by all of these content producers. Like, you should have contracts for people that are on your show. Otherwise, at the end of the day, it's more of a verbal agreement. And like, looking at that is really bad when it comes to when it comes to friends being on the show. When it comes to people that you would go and have a drink with, and then the next day you do a show together, and then shit just kind of goes awry, awry, and you don't have you don't have that that legal agreement there, that binding agreement where they can just go do whatever they want, or you can do whatever you want and kick them off the show, et cetera, et cetera. So that definitely needs to be improved behind the scenes. But other than that, like I, I don't think uh, I could ever act on anything like that with, and and I never would. Uh, I would never want that that I guess power is the best way to say that. But at the end of the day, I would never act on anything like that. When you had your hiatus. Uh, and, and, and we're kind of considering your future. And I, and I remember it, it, was, it, was, it was very public. Uh, if I remember right, I think you tweeted um, about the turmoil you were kind of in, you were, you were at a crossroads. Um, right. And I think, yeah, I think you said, um, you know, you may have to consider leaving esports behind. Um, what was it that kind of hooked you back in and, and, and made you get on the horse again? Um. It was actually, believe it or not, it was kind of a combination of Total Biscuit and a combination of Day 9. I was just, I don't know what I was doing. I was watching TV or watching a stream or something. And uh, John just messaged me on Skype and just bluntly said, like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was just like, well, I'm not, I'm not really doing much of anything, John. How are you? And he's like, why aren't you, like, doing content? And I kind of, like, talked to him about it. And he's like, well, just fucking start doing content again. Like, that's all you have to do. And... I was like, you know, you're probably right. And, and that started to, to kind of like push me along. And then uh, just talking with Sean, he was just like, Sean's always been the mentality. And, and I've always had this mentality. I just wasn't acting on it, of like, just do it. Whatever, whatever you want to do, like if you want to start a business, don't, don't think, just do it. And then think about mm -hmm. it afterwards. And, and that's kind of the approach that I've always had to my content. And it, I just I wasn't making money. I was just kind of like burning on uh, savings that I had uh, while I was with MLG, and I was I was here in Dallas and just kind of wasting away, just kind of trying to figure out what the fuck I was doing, which was kind of an excuse for just like doing nothing. Yeah. And and with with me personally, boredom, and and this is probably true for a lot of other people, but boredom definitely leads to depression, and that's probably what I was in. It's just some weird depressive funk mood where I just wasn't doing anything. And then as soon as I started doing something and like fixed my sleep schedule, I was like, all right, well, this is easy. Like, 
this is what I should have been doing this entire time instead of just like wasting two months during the off period of esports, which luckily it kind of fell into that time period because there wasn't mm. all that going on. There wasn't much all of, of stuff going on. And then with WCS and, and the LCS and, and all that stuff, it just kind of kicked up recently. So got lucky again, I guess. <laughs> okay, well, well, we're going to talk some more about the money side of things. I think this is a big part of that. You know, obviously, Marcus has to count his millions, so I didn't want to bother him with it. <laughs> um, but, you know, me and you, I think we're keeping it real. Like, you can see, you know, from my backdrop here and your, your office, <laughs> you're like... We're keeping it real. We're keeping it esports real. So, um, but just before we get into that, uh, we are going to go over to James, who's been uh, getting questions and everything else uh, from Twitter and Reddit and all the other and Twitch TV chat and all the other things. So, yeah. James, sure. what have we had going on out there? We've had quite a lot of questions, especially in the chat. Everyone's been mm. very talkative, which is great. Keep it up, everyone. Keep it up, as I'm reading everything. Um, First thing I'll go to, because it's relevant to what you were just talking about with your hiatus for, after MLG. Someone says um, on Twitter, have you ever regretted not moving to New York and working for MLG at any point in time? Are you happier now, now that you're back doing things? Are you happier now than when you were working with MLG? Um, happier now than when I was working with MLG? Uh, it's two different time, types of happiness. Like... When I was with MLG, it was stable, it was, it was constant, it was not worrying about producing a piece of content this week because I need the, the revenue for that monthly check, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that happiness when I was with MLG was all about stability and, and I enjoyed where I was living uh, there in Galveston, Texas, the, the fact that I was kind of like the recluse of the, uh, the company where people could talk to me but I didn't have that human interaction, which is also a good and bad thing. Um, it, it's just, I, it, the, the question of if I regret, uh, I don't, it's, it's definitely not regret, it's more of like, what if I was living in New York right now, like, what, what would my life be like? And I would probably be in, I would think the same situation, like, New York is an incredibly expensive city to live in, mm -hmm. and the uh, amount of money required to live in there is just, it's, it's astronomical. And, and I would probably be about where I am right now. And, and if you kind of parallel the two, uh, two salaries that I, or the two amounts of income that I get um, being in Dallas and being in New York. So I think that I'm happier living in Dallas because New York, I, it's just not a city for me. It's, it's, it's a grind just yeah. to getting to work. Like, and, and I don't enjoy that. My getting to work is the 10 feet when I get out of bed and walk over into this room and, and or the, the two mouse clicks that I get turning on the stream. So I enjoy yeah. that aspect of it for sure. Well, that's actually someone, someone asked in the chat, a guy called It's True Stu asked, um, do you ever get cabin fever? Which is very related to this kind of thing. You know, you're, you're inside, you're working on the internet a lot of time. Do you ever get, do you ever, like you said you enjoy that. Is that, is that something you're happy with? Would you prefer oh, I, to? I, I, I love it, yeah. I... I am definitely the type of person, and I've kind of been like this my entire life, where if I don't, if, if I'm left alone in a room for a week and have zero interaction with, with other people in person, I'm all right with that. It, it does not yeah. bother me what, whatsoever. It, it definitely has an effect on me, and that's when I need to like go see a movie with my roommate or, or go out and, and eat somewhere in public or instead of just going and getting fast food or having something delivered. Like That aspect is definitely something that you have to do just as a human being or you'll be really fucked up in the head. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely like a very introspective person. Like I, yeah. I don't mind being alone the entire time. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it, it, it kind of, it, get, it gets rid of that cabin fever if you do, if you're, yeah. if you're able to be conscious of when you need to go out and, you know, and things like that. It's, it's, it's good, but I suppose it's a lot, you know, we're gamers, we spend most of the time on our computers anyway, exactly. so everyone can relate to it. To like some everyone extent. grew up on this, so... Yeah, I, definitely. Me, it just hasn't changed. <laughs> cool. Uh, we also had a couple of questions in the chat as well, um, which kind of asked the same the same kind of question, but one of them's asking, you know, what would you, what sort of shows would you rather be doing, and which shows would you not do again? So Meta B, for instance, asked, you've done a lot of different stuff from hosting events and talk shows, from producing an MLG stream. So, what's your fo most fond memory of what you've worked on in the past? And what would you never do again? Fondest memory would probably be producing uh, the MLG Anaheim event last year where we had the Cuspa players come in. Um, 
and, and it was definitely the moment of when the Cusp players were introduced on stage and, and kind of the one uh, leading that and from the producer role, at least not directing it. And then as it was happening, like standing next to Sundance and, and Adam Apsell, two of my good friends and still are to this day, and just kind of like being in that moment and, and knowing that like I was a part of that is, is definitely one of the proudest moments for me. And, and I'll probably... Never forget that situation or that feeling of just like, I can't believe this is happening. Like in front of me, these are people that I've, I've followed and these are people that are just respected worldwide. And I was the person like kind of that, that helped make it happen. Um, and then what, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. What's something that I, um, I what would you, yeah. Doing? What have you done in the past that you would never do again? Um, you know, I'll probably... For whatever reason, if Blizzard ever asked me to cast a BlizzCon again, I probably wouldn't do it. Uh, I was oh incredibly thankful for that experience, but I, I don't have, I, I don't want that attention or that. I don't want to be on that okay. stage again. I, I, that thread was some of the like harshest shit that I have ever seen anyone take, uh, mm -hmm. and I read every thread about everything on Reddit on a daily basis. And it was it was brutal, man. It, it was definitely like <laughs> I was drinking my sorrows away that night after reading uh -huh. the thread, which was a huge fucking mistake. Like, don't do that if you're a caster or a content producer. Right after you do something, just go and like F5 the thread. But um, yeah, that was definitely yeah. the... And, and that's not so much a regret. It's just something I wouldn't do again. I'm yeah, glad that I did that. Yeah, it harks back to last week, what Thoron was saying about um, having to have a hard shell when you're in yeah. this business. Yeah, um, which is very true. And the other question, which kind of related to that, I kind of bunched them together, was: um, Would you? What if there's a type of? Is there a type of show that you haven't done that you would want to do? Like, is there something you would like to present in terms of maybe an event? Um, if you could do, I anything. don't know if I'd if I'd want to work at it per se, uh, but I'd love to go to a dream hack. I think that's kind of the one event that I haven't been to yet that is unique enough to warrant a trip uh, across the world to, uh, just to kind of yeah. see all that go down. And I have a, a lot of respect and I think I've given a lot of shit to them publicly, but it's only cause I enjoy it so much that I, I am passionate about it and I'm able to uh, pick it apart piece by piece because of that is, is the dream hack event. Um, but I, I love, I've watched every single thing that they've done, uh, for esports, and, and that's definitely something I'd want to do. Um, in terms of a show, I, I think if I ever got to the point where I would have a studio to work in and a team, that's where things would really get to be a lot of fun for me because I wouldn't have to be the guy turning the stream on, switching the stuff, asking the questions. Uh, I mean, I mean, Richard, you, I guess both of you could probably relate to this. Like, if you're doing all that and someone asks you, or you ask someone a question, it's really hard to listen to what the fuck they're saying when you're worrying, like, is yeah. the stream up? Is everyone happy? Is there, am I dropping mm -hmm. frames? Do I need to switch to that scene? Do I need to go to that screen? And then it's like, well, shit, I, I actually just didn't listen to what they were saying, and I should have been the entire time. Yeah. It's kind and of I found myself in that situation a lot. Where I'm yeah. just like, shit, I don't have a follow up it, to this. It's, it's I not just that as well. Like, I mean, I'll I'll totally go on the record and say this. Like, I actually begrudge as the talent having to fucking do like the small things. Like, that's gonna make me sound like such an asshole. But like, yeah. I put serious. I but I put so much in. Uh, like, prime example, the writing. Okay, like if I've yep. got to fucking write a 3,000 word investigatory piece about why someone's a douche and, and I need to get it, you know, and I need to get it out there, you know, once I've finished writing it and it, maybe it's took a few days or whatever, I don't want to fucking have to be the guy who then puts it on Reddit or <laughs> even, even putting it on my own Twitter, like is a fucking liberty at that point. You just feel yeah. so exhausted. You get and like, I know, no one's going to come out and say this. Like I'm probably <laughs> the only guy who would actually say this. Like everyone else in these spots is like, Oh man, I got such a good work ethic and I work yeah. so hard. But like, I just think at that stage, once I've finished a piece of work, I want to stand back and admire the reaction it gets. I don't want to have to be pimping it out, you know, like, uh, uh, sorry. That, that's definitely something that I've, learned like the the workflow for state of the game now and pretty much for all the shows i do is like it's so i don't want to say precise that's probably not the best word but it, it's so like structured that 
Mm. I start the show, I record the VOD. If it's a two-part state of the game, as soon as I end that local recording, I will upload it as the show is going on. So then when it's over, all I have to do is type in a couple things, uh, copy and paste some tags on the YouTube video, hit live, put it on Reddit, go make a post on the website, copy and paste the former post, put the MP3 link in it, put the YouTube link in it, <laughs> upload that, go upload the Team Liquid thread, and then I'm done. And it takes like 15, 20 minutes. But it's like, if I didn't do that, I would just sit there and like procrastinate of, and it would take like an hour. <laughs> well, the words, but it's that um, I've done it so many times, I can just like work through it really quickly. They're definitely the words from a person with experience. That's something we find <laughs> hard doing. Cause we're very new. Well, streamgasm wise, we're very new to this, especially this kind of show. Yeah. I was going to say Richard, like he doesn't, he's quite open about not liking to do this stuff. That's why we're here. That's why yeah, we exactly. It. But we're still pretty <laughs> new. To it, so. It's just as fucking well I am because you know. Yeah. We, we, it's giving you guys a job, which is awesome. And yeah, I would, I would have come looking for you anyway. And to be fair, I don't treat you like the lap dogs that I probably could. No, you know, no of course you don't. I, I was only joking. I, you know. <laughs> Thank, thanks oh, for getting that on air. Cheers. <laughs> but um, it, what we're going to do is, James, we are going to come back to you when it's slightly less awkward. Uh, and uh, if you, you make sure you keep. You make sure you keep getting all the Twitter uh, questions. Do keep them coming in. At the end, we're going to do the question, uh, how can eSports streams improve? We've had a few people suggest that. So, James, will be paying particular attention to that for our show wrap-up. So we'll be back with you in about 20 minutes, James. Excellent. Right, to, to you, JP. Money matters. Uh, you've touched on something that I think is absolutely vitally important to talk about in eSports, and that is the point when you weren't making any money from your content and you were living on savings. Mm -hmm. Nothing, I think, can be more disheartening. You know, I've, I've done this when I was trying to be a, a mainstream journalist. I had loads of credit cards. And if there was a big, this is true, if there was loads of, uh, if there was a story breaking, or if I thought I could get a good article, I would pay the money to be there and try and cover it on my own dime and then try and sell the story. And I, I did this. I followed a traveling freak show around for uh, a few weeks, all of my own money. I racked up about two grand. This is in the, this is in the late nineties, early noughties. I racked up about two grand of debt to get a story that I couldn't sell to anyone for 150 fucking quid. And at that point I was thinking, what the fuck am I doing? Like, and that was when I, I went and started selling mobile phones for a living. Um, a dark, a dark chapter in my life. <laughs> Um, so t t t talk us through what it's like when you, you know, when you're there and you're watching your money fritter away and yeah. your, your content's non-productive. Um, well, I mean, I, I think just to kind of start off with, with where I started was, was back in, in the days of being 18, being a senior in high school and, and writing for Gottfrag, uh, back in kind of its heyday. And, uh, that's kind of where I got my break. Uh, I ended up leaving Gottfrag about three or four weeks before they signed with MLG. Um, having known that it was going to happen, I just I couldn't wait any longer. Someone offered me a job over at WSVG um, as a reporter and uh, kind of keep, keep doing what I was doing with ArenaCast at the time. And that was kind of like the first real job that I had in esports. I was making a monthly salary. I was being flown around the U.S. to all the WSVG events and, and going to New York when they had offices at GMP. And um, then I ended up leaving that job just kind of out of, being bored and boredom le leading to laziness, and then I just wasn't doing anything. Um, and so I, I felt bad enough just for getting a paycheck for not doing that, that I was either going to get fired or I just left. So I ended up just leaving because I didn't want to have the, the depression of, of being fired from somewhere. Um, and then, then I was in college when that all went down. I, I took a semester off from college uh, to kind of fulfill that... Um, not dream, but fulfill that job. Went back to college, uh, kept on doing stuff uh, in esports, but just kind of on the side. And say the game came around, I started doing that, started making a little bit of money on the ad side of things. And when I say a little bit of money, it's actually like a little bit of money that we don't, when you have, I, I want to say this just because a lot of people are misunderstood. If, if you have 10,000 people on a stream, that's great. If you don't run a single ad, you make about $10 from that stream. Like, that's what it actually means, guys. It's not like you get 10K people on a stream and you're, like, fucking counting the $20 bills that you get. It, there, it's not like that at all. Um, and so State of the Game did very well numbers-wise. In fact, I, I think mm. we hit – back then, I think we had a couple 20,000 K show, or 20, viewer shows, and, and the average was around 
11 to 15, but it was all one show. It, it was all one or two hour block. There was no commercial breaks. And that was a really bad mistake because I made like $40 a show back then. Um, luckily, I didn't have to support myself because I was in college at the time and I was living at home and I didn't really have any uh, anything to pay for. I was just, it was money on the side that I could use to go to an eSport event or, or pay to go somewhere or pay to drink that weekend, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then fast forward to today, I've gotten better with, with monetizing everything. The, the industry has gotten better at monetizing everything. Um, I think the the hardest thing with this industry is that you cannot you cannot live on ad revenue because there's no way to know what you're going to be making next month um, with that. So things like the Twitch TV subscriber uh, um, tool that they have is, is definitely a way to know ahead of time how much you'll be making and then everything else on top of that is kind of just more. Um, doing merchandise, which is something that I should have done a long, long time ago, which I'm just now branching out into, is, is very good uh, because once again, it is a you know what you're going to be making from that to some extent. Obviously, you don't know how many shirts or how many whatever you're going to sell. Um, but yeah, like I, I've I've settled in with with all of that, and and I'm doing I'm doing all right now. Like I can't complain. But the state of this industry is that it all might come crashing down in, in a week when I just have to stop doing my shows because something happens. Like Twitch TV decides they're done. They, they've made enough money and they're just going to stop. Like, well, then I'm screwed. Like I have to go over to Ustream, which I don't know, and there's not really a subscriber, et cetera, et cetera, over there. So that, that uncertainty is, is kind of shitty for people getting into the it, – it's definitely shitty for people getting into the uh, industry and, and wanting to make uh, a lot of money where – there's not really a lot of people that make a lot of money. In fact, there's not really anyone that makes a ton of money from this because whatever they make, they just pour back into it because that's how mm. stupid we all are in this industry. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about <laughs> how right. How passionate we all are, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's forward that on a little bit and, and just ask you about kind of, you know, things that, things that prevent monetization. I mean, there was a big argument on Twitter about six months ago, I think it was, uh, you know, people talking about ad block. Um, you know, and things like that, yeah. and, and how ad block is going to kill esports. Um, and you know, some people say it's a consumer right. Uh, you know, I should be able to use ad block. Uh, the people that were having their ads blocked were saying, "Well, it's really fucking us, and we're not going to be able to stream and and whatnot." Where where do, where do you stand on it? Um, I mean, I, I guess I'll start with as someone who uses ad block on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I, I think that it's shitty and that content creators should find a way to monetize outside of ad block. Mm. And what that is, I don't know. Luckily, Twitch TV gave me subscribers and, and that's kind of what I look at. Um, but saying that as a content creator, it is incredibly hard to be able to monetize outside of, of running ads. It is it a very, it's a very frail way of making an, uh, a living um, because, like I said, or like you're saying, ad block can fuck everything up with that. Um, but at the end of the day, should people be allowed to ad block? I guess so. I mean, I do it. If I, I hate when I go to a stream and I immediately get an ad as soon as I join. Uh, I think that's kind of a, as a content creator, that is bad and I've actually been meaning to turn off pre-rolls uh, on a lot of the shows because if someone wants to check a stream, they should be able to tune on the turn on the stream and see exactly what it is, not wait 30 seconds or, or 60 seconds, however long the, the ad's going to be, um, to view the content. And, mm -hmm. and I haven't turned that off yet, but I know a lot of streamers, uh, for example, Lethal Frag, I think, who is a general vi video game streamer on, on Twitch, probably one of the biggest. Um, he is now in, in full sub-only chat. I believe he turns off his pre-rolls and he runs an ad every... He runs three minutes of ads every hour. Mm. And I think that's probably the best way to kind of monetize that because then it is purely a subscriber-based income. Mm. And at the end of the day, you're going to make a lot more with that than you are with ads, regardless of how many viewers you have. So that's kind of I, my take on it. Yeah, I, I kind of said something similar at the time, which is... Um, you know, imagine TV without uh, TV ads. If, 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 if you as a viewer could not watch them, 
you know, I mean, the way TV is now, it's like, I mean, in America, it's next fucking level. I mean, you know, <laughs> I watch American shows and it is like one scene ad break, you know, about eight ad breaks in a 40 yeah. minute. It, you know. It's even worse than that, Richard. It's gotten to where yeah. they, they advertise during the show. With yeah, I've seen the little bug. bars at the bottom. Yeah, And it's so it's like, oh, my God, I don't fucking care about some show coming on eight o'clock on Saturday. Yeah. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I want to watch this show. Stop spamming me with this shit. But yeah, exactly. They found so, a way. They found a way to advertise. In, without, in, so. in the UK, uh, kind of how it is, uh, is at the moment, we generally get every 10 to 15 minutes, a, a five minute block of ads. Um, uh, but they're all synchronized. So if you've got satellite or cable and you think, well, fuck it, I'm not going to watch these adverts, you go flick onto another channel, they're having their break as well. Ah. So you can't avoid advertising. But the TV <laughs> industry would be completely fucked without it. You know, I mean, yeah, it, exactly. it, it, if you could block ads, people would be saying, well, there's no point in investing in this anymore because no one's watching our commercials. We're not reaching anyone. And it would eventually kill off, kill off television. So, yeah. you know, if, if something is big and as prevalent as television is susceptible to the gods of advertising revenue, then obviously esports enthusiasts should probably think about maybe disabling the ad block for, you know, for one, two minutes. And I'm in a privileged position. Like, I don't monetize this just as well because we get no fucking viewers. But, you know, it, it, I, don't, I, I don't monetize any of the shows we do or I don't monetize the YouTube channel because, frankly, A, it wouldn't be worth it for the audience we reach and B, it's not something I would do anyway. What we look to do is we look to have partnerships. So... Mm -hmm. We, we may eventually have this show sponsored by someone if someone wanted to do that. And we sure. would, uh, you know, how much would that endorsement, if you like, that partnership, how much would that be worth? That's, that's the kind of thing we would look to do rather than just go on ad revenue. So following on from that, I mean, is that something that you feel the industry could do? We could all get a little bit smarter, reach out to companies and bring yeah. them in as partners of, of, of content? I, I don't know if, it, if it's that people need to get smarter about it. I think it's just that we need, or we, we don't need it. We, we just, we want more people, more companies to get involved like that. Like, mm. I think your, your previous guest, Weed, is probably the only content creator who was smart enough to go and make one more game TV and then pull in all those sponsors. Mm. And he gets a lot of shit for like being this EG run corporation. <laughs> At the end of the day, guess who's making the money, guys? Like, he's getting paid for doing shows far more than what you're making off of ads and that mm. is awesome like kudos to him for doing that he's the one that actually should be praised for going and doing that rather than getting shit on for having eg members on his show when they're fucking entertaining like inside the game has three eg people on it but they're three people that are always entertaining and they're always going to be funny like who the fuck cares at the end of the day what what team they belong to or where the money's coming from like it's entertaining shit that's that's something that I think to to maybe defend Marcus a little bit that he gets a lot of shit for that that sucks, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've I've always been hinting at something for State of the Game, and uh, we were real close to locking in a deal with Gamespot. Uh, I think that was last year or maybe a year before, and uh, some people changed uh, inside of Gamespot, and and I kind of just lost interest in it. I get I get real tired of dealing with with contracts and, and lawyers and all this legal shit, Richard, where it's just mm. like, at the end of the day, I either want to have someone do that for me or I just don't want to do it at all. Like, I just want to make content at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and that's, that sucks for me because, like, I'll, I want these, these big sponsorships on the show, but because of my uh, laziness with that, I'll probably not get them that way. And, and I need to definitely work on that. But that's the way... That's definitely something that everyone should be trying to do for shows. It's just, it's really hard to get those sponsors when, when Wheat already has them all. You know what I'm saying? Like, all mm -hmm. of his shows have so many different sponsors on them, and that's great for him. Like, huge congratulations to Wheat for having all that. Well, this is the reason why I had you both on the show in, in half. So in a lot of ways, I do see you as kind of the flip side of, of the content coin. Because we, as you say, is, is, is the lord of the realm. He's got the sponsors, the, the hookups. He's pretty much got it all. And he's got a, a, a great fan base, who I think generally, apart from the DDoSs, are uh, pretty supportive of his uh, continued efforts within esports. Uh, right. You, on the other hand, I see as somebody that has got a similar longevity, but no one really knows a lot of your story, you've been around a while, you've produced great content, you've pioneered content that's been emulated, yet I, I don't see you getting as, as, as much of the plaudits. Now, with that in mind, and you've talked about how, you know, 
Wheat has the sponsors. And, and again, one of the things that gets talked about in esports a lot is EG has been great for the North American scene in terms of exposure in esports, but it's only really been great for EG because... Right. You know they've got all, they've got the stranglehold now. If I was a business, why would I want to sponsor any other team? You know, it's it's almost sure. like a fucking monopoly. So you've just said there that wheat having all the sponsors is great, but it is great for him. Is 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 there not kind of a a worry now that if you wanted to kind of sponsor a content producer, you would immediately look to him, and therefore he's got a little bit of a monopoly? Um, I mean, I I think you would definitely. And again, I'm, I can't speak for all of the, the organizations out there looking into to sponsor esports, but I think you would see Wheat probably first. And, and mm. if that's who you want to approach, then that's who you approach. I, I think that Wheat is a stand up guy to where he, he if, if it doesn't fit what he's looking for, then he'll offer, like, hey, maybe you should go look into Chan Man or, or look into Richard Lewis or look into JP McDaniel. Like, Luckily, we, we have him at the helm where he will definitely do something like that. Mm. Um, and a, a lot of it, too, is just that it, those people only sponsor what they know. And what they know is what they're being told by people in the industry that have those conversations with them. And mm. luckily, I, I have enough of a uh, – I've been able to network well enough that, that I am good friends with, with the Sundance. And, and he was uh, pretty – Heavily, not heavily involved, but heavily, um, he was one of the main reasons that the whole GameSpot deal started with State of the Game. Um, yeah. And and like I said, luckily I have those those uh, networking opportunities that maybe eventually you'll see whatever sponsoring State of the Game. But um, at the end of the day, I don't fault these other corporations. I don't fault the EGs of the world for having all these ties and, and having that key to kind of that kingdom of of the sponsorships like. In my opinion, good for them. They they deserve that because if you look at what Alex done for esports, is he's probably brought in more money than a lot of other people. Mm. I, I don't know how to quantify what those other people are, but he's definitely brought in a ton of money to esports. And if that all if that money is all for him, then that's fine with me because it gets spent in the industry as well. Yeah, um, and and of course I was playing a little bit of devil's advocate there. Scoots did make a good sure. point in the chat. Which of course is you can't have uh, all the sponsors because some sponsors won't work with each other. Um, exactly. Uh, you know, pa Papa John's and Pizza Hut, a slasher. Uh, <laughs> that tweet was so <laughs> fucking awesome, man. Revealing yeah. Pizza Hut. I just got to get that in there. But anyway, um, so I, I got two, two two more questions for you, um, and they're sure. kind of similar to what we were talking about with uh, with Wheat at the end of the segment, and then we're going to go over to the the viewers' questions. First would be um, just. Where where is where is the end game for a content producer like yourself? Because you know you've been you've been in the shadows for a while. Um, yet you've given so much over to the esports industry, just in terms of of ideas uh, as as well as the content itself. Um, is it something where you think you know what I'd like to get to that stage where I am a, a DJ Week style personality and I, I get the plaudits and and the financial rewards or do you see this as maybe a stepping stone to a career outside of esports so you'll be able to go you know to a prospective employer and say look I produce these shows on a fucking shoestring look how good they are I'd love to work in say the TV industry or you know radio or, or something like that sure um, you know I've, I've thought about that question a lot like what what is all the of this leading up to and at the end of the day, I, I usually don't answer the question and just go back to making content. I, I feel that I don't know. No one really knows what all this is leading up to. Hopefully, this is leading up to esports being on the BBC or ABC or NBC or CBS, like being somewhere on TV where we're all uh, a lot bigger than we already are. And, and maybe that's the, the dream of all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I see it as a stepping stone to going and getting a job at a developer, whether it's a, a, a Blizzard or a Riot or or whoever, you know, as kind of a community manager and, and working on that then. And a lot of a lot of the problems that I see with that is, well, I couldn't do the shows that I've like loved to do for the past year and a half or two years, however long I've done them. Mm -hmm. um, so right now I've I've kind of just been living in the now and, and not thinking too far ahead except for planning shows um, and, and I'll probably just stick with that like if, if I get too involved in what's in the future I think it might actually be 
somewhat of a, a downer uh, because we don't know what's in the future. Like, like I said, this all might come crashing down, and, mm. and hopefully it won't. It would take a lot. It would take a huge catastrophe for all of this to come crashing down. Um, but it might. Like, we, mm. we don't know yeah. what, what the future holds in a year and a half or two years. So if, if that happens, then I can't, come and, I can't go and become a journalist for a newspaper because those are already almost all dead. So maybe I become a... <laughs> A blogger or, or something even worse than that like to me I, I think that that's kind of the that's kind of like the the end game that I don't want uh, I want to keep doing what I'm doing right now and, and hopefully the industry uh, allows for that and mm. at the end of the day I don't really want to think too much further than that okay um, and then I guess uh, just as the the final question it would be I mean since you've come back to Esports and have been producing your content regular again. Um, you're starting to see how it's being well received. You know, you had the huge scoop with the Idra story. I think people are starting to, you know, now that you've spent a little bit of time away, people are starting to realize what what they've missed. You know, uh, which is always true of the esports audience. Um, <laughs> so, do you? Uh, I mean, do you feel renewed? Like you're going to be able to continue doing this for a, a long time? Um. I don't know if it's renewed. I, I think what it actually is, uh, Richard, is that for a while there, I was, I was, what's the best way to phrase this? I was kind of just coasting along. I, I was getting paid for what I was doing. I didn't have to worry about money. I wasn't working to live in a sense. Mm -hmm. And without that strive, without that kind of always looming over my shoulder like, well, if I don't do a show this week, I probably won't get paid again. Like that, that's something that always crosses my mind. So now I always have to start thinking of doing more stuff, of doing more shows. And, and without that drive, I, I think that me as a, uh, myself as a person, like I need that. If, if I don't, then I just become really lazy and, and what happens uh, in December and January happens again. So hopefully I don't like win the lottery or something and, and I just get really lazy because I, I enjoy this drive. I enjoy the the thrill of like producing a show and, and working on a show and, and keeping it consistent because at the end of the day that's probably the most like important thing is this industry is one, get something out there and then two, do it again a hundred times mm. and, and a lot of people and then improve on it the hundred times. Don't try to make it perfect the first time. Because um, it won't be. No, nothing will ever be perfect the first time. And it won't be perfect the hundredth time. You always want to strive for that perfection. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of where I'm at. It, if I didn't have that drive, I'd probably just turn into a, a lazy piece of shit again. So <laughs> I don't want that to happen. And if you did win the lottery, roughly how, you know, how much money would you invest in esports? Or would we you just know, never... <laughs> I've actually thought about this, Richard. Yeah. I would, if I won the lottery, like I think this past weekend it was like $600 million or something, I'd probably throw... I mean, you only need like what, <laughs> 10, 15 million to live on for your life, and you like you can live pretty comfortably on that if you yeah. invest well. I'd probably throw the rest of it back into esports in some way, whether that's opening a studio and, and producing content out of that, uh, or or I don't know, starting a team or, or doing something stupid and crazy like that is probably what I would do. Okay, well, just don't bring back CGS because that seems to be very yeah. fucking yeah. very fucking expensive. Uh, <laughs> right, so. We're going to go over to uh, your questions to end the show on. Uh, that's the people out there. I'm pointing at you. James, what's been happening on Twitter and Twitch TV chat and everywhere else? Um, we had a comment. We were talking about uh, sustainable, like uh, sustaining yourself uh, financially. Um, mm -hmm. If you ignore ad revenue, what would be a tip that you would give a content creator who's creating good content, but is what would be the number one piece of advice you'd give to to sustain themselves financially apart from ad revenue because I because you especially when you're starting out your viewer numbers are yep. so small that you can't sustain yourself on that kind of thing what would be tip number one I mean that's that's rough I think there's a lot of people that are at that situation and and like I said I, I definitely not lucked out but I, I had the privilege of, of getting those subscribers and, and that's something you should strive for but it's not something they're going to give you with a hundred viewers a week um, so aside from that and, and you're not going to make more than I mean to, to get into it like you won't make more if you run a commercial every I think it's what every seven minutes you can run however many commercials you want and you have a hundred viewers you'll probably make somewhere in the ballpark of 
I don't know, 150 or 200 a month. And that's just mm -hmm. kind of the reality of, of ads right now. And that, that might even be a little bit too much. Um, so to support yourself, I don't know, get a, get a job, get a real yeah. world job. And, and hopefully you can use that. A lot of people, and, and this is, like I said, for me, like if you are lazy, then you're not going to make it anyways. If, if you are striving and barely making it week to week, month to month, that is where like true success is found, at least in my eyes, where you can push yourself to kind of do all of that at the same time. Then I think that's kind of where success lies for, for a person. So that's kind of a bullshit answer. I think at the end of the day, like it's a difficult question. Money. I knew it was yeah. kind of difficult, but it's kind you're of you're just not going to make money doing that. It's something I was day. I've obviously been thinking about, and yeah, the, the guy who commented it was Sigmund TV was obviously okay. yeah. It's a consistency, yeah. man. Just keep streaming because eventually, doing it, yeah, doing perfect doing. example. Lethal Frag once again on Twitch started off with two people watching a stream. Now he goes live every day for six to seven hours and has four thousand. And that was because he's been streaming for like 506 days straight. So that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, how you build an audience. Just, just to, as well, I've, I've probably said this on previous shows, but uh, I mean, I, you know, I've been in that position as well, you know, from a journalistic perspective. It wasn't a very lucrative, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of opportunities in the industry. I got offered my first job uh, post CGS. Uh, yeah. And it was it was it was next to nothing. It wasn't enough to live off. I think I had maybe forty pounds a month disposable income after I'd paid rent, food, and bills, and it was a miserable existence. But you know, I I I went up balls deep, man. I just went all fucking in, and yeah. and you know, I was sleeping on a friend's couch, paying him you know cheap rent. I, I was just literally trying to do everything I could, just say you know, in the knowledge that if I kept working at it and kept being good eventually I'd have to get my dues. That was like how I looked at it. And, you know, it, I can totally re relate with what you were talking about earlier with the fucking, you know, the depression of it, the cabin fever, all of this stuff yeah. that's been brought up because, you know, I, was, I didn't have money to go out. I couldn't even relieve my fucking boredom. It was, it, you know, literally, like, I mean, how many times can you jerk off in a day or whatever? Like, it, was, it was fucking <laughs> savage, right? You know, like, there was nothing else to do. What can you do with £40 a month? You know, yeah. nothing. You know, it was, it was, it was horrible. Uh, so... But, but I, I, you know, I got there. And whether I got there because I was good or whether I was just persistent, like a fucking barnacle, it doesn't really matter, yeah, you know? You, you, yeah. 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 <laughs> you got to hustle, man. Yeah. Life, life is about hustling. Like, you have to fucking work for it. I think it's just, that's the bottom line in, in, in everything. Like, if you're not the first one at the door, then be the second one at the door and be first next time. Like, you got to always be there before everyone else and, and do whatever you're doing to the best of your ability. And I think that eventually you'll get lucky. <laughs> I, I, I like that as well. People are saying maybe that should be the question of the day. Like, instead of how can eSports streams improve, how many times can you jerk off in a day? Maybe that would, that's, well, <laughs> we'll, 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 maybe we'd have got loads more responses. I, well, I think, I think maybe we do that next next show. So, uh, But yeah, sorry, James. Uh, what, what else have the good people been saying for James? Um, there was an interesting day? comment I saw, which I just wanted to bring up. Someone's called Shadow Smile said they ran into you at a grocery store, apparently. And I suppose this kind of relates to the whole, you know, we're always indoors and, you know, we go out every now and again. We have to get groceries. So, you know, I just thought it was quite nice. And this person said, say hi. And they appreciated what you were doing. And it was um, the most awkward conversation ever that they've ever had. So. Oh, I actually remember that. That was awkward, man. That was an awkward conversation. That was Does that happen often? Galveston. Um, I've had a couple of fan run-ins. Uh, yeah. I was I was on a date seeing Thor actually uh, the the Marvel Entertainment movie and we were standing in line and this uh, younger kid comes up to me and he's like are you J P McDaniel and I was like <laughs> yeah what's what's going on and I like the person that I was with didn't know that I like did all this stuff on the internet oh, really so it was like the, it was almost I think it was the first date actually and uh, he was like can I can I get a picture with you and I'm just like. <laughs> Fuck, like God, that's cool it. though. That's cool. It, it was cool, but it's like fuck. Now I have to explain to her that like I make video games or I make a living by playing. <laughs> it's not even games. that though. Like you've got a small kid asking to have the photograph taken yeah, yeah. with you. I mean, it there's a lot the of explaining part, to do. The small the kid part can... was we we did the photograph, and I was like, thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you, and I was curious and whatever, and uh, I was like, well, that was weird. I I tried to like play it off and. About five minutes later, him and like his two other friends come up and ask for an autograph for me to like sign their hat. 
I was just like, <laughs> oh my god, I don't want to be this person. Like, I'm not that cool, guys. Please don't make me sign your hat. And uh, other than that, it, it's always been like uh, I met the guy at the grocery store. Um, that was in uh, Galveston. Um, the other one was in San Antonio. Um, I've met a couple people up here in Dallas, but um, other than that, I haven't really been recognized all that much in public, which I'm yeah. totally fine with. Like, if yeah, you just, guys know me in public, please talking. come and say hi. But I, I really don't like fan interaction like that <laughs> in the public, <laughs> just because it can get awkward. Yeah. Um, someone called Andy Rue, 42, said um, that in the past you've said you would want to do a real talk on yourself. Who would yeah. you like to interview you for that? Uh, we were actually... We, I almost pulled the trigger on doing it uh, a little while ago with DJ Wheat as the host. I, I think that he'll always... And, and he's offered. He offered it before I even asked him. And, and I was glad about that because I think that he would probably be the one guy that I would trust to, to A, run the actual show from XSplit to switching scenes and all that. And, and B... Um, from knowing me, a lot of the people that are on the show I know really closely as a friend, so I can kind of create the, the questions from that and know what the answer is going to be and then make the follow-up question from that. Maybe that's cheating a little bit, but I think the wheat knows me well enough, maybe, maybe not too well, to be able to ask the, the proper questions that would be interesting enough. So it would definitely be DJ Wheat. That's cool. And then, yeah, the rest, a lot of the um, replies we've had now, a couple of them have been about the question. How can esports streams improve? And it's obviously something, a question we'd like to put to you, JP, as well. Um, so first off, yeah, how, how can esports streams and shows, how can they improve? What would, what would you do to improve them? I think that the biggest improvement that we can go to now is, is everyone, for the most part, has kind of mastered how to do a show online through XSplit, through Skype. And the, the next step at least from a content creator's perspective, is to have that studio. Um, Richard, you mentioned the Pulse. Uh, probably, well, no, it, it definitely was the best produced show in all of esports. Agreed, man. It, last, it looked great, but... It, it lasted it, 10 episodes, Yeah, I think. Maybe 11. But no, it, maybe it was more than that. It lasted a couple episodes. Um, and that sucks. Like, I don't know what, what happens. Hopefully we know more from that camp because uh, they said it's on hiatus indefinitely. Um, but I, I think that studios are the next step. But I don't know when that step will occur because it, it costs so much to be able to rent something mm -hmm. out like that. Um, I know of a couple groups already in the scene that, that have studios and are planning to do stuff with that. And, and hopefully I can be a part of that in some form, whether it's working out of them or working out of them eventually or, or whatever. But... That's definitely the next step from a content creator's perspective. Yeah, I, f I find as well that having conversations and, and you know with multiple people like this is so much more natural when you're all sat in front of each other. Oh, it's in a real world situation. It's yeah, so silence on Skype just fucks everything up. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Um, one thing that a lot of people have mentioned in the chat every time we bring it up is punctuality. I suppose this is something we can both we can all kind of relate to. Um, a lot of shows are, are about really late fucking and... sticklers about that shit. Like we've gone yeah. out five minutes late tonight, like, and we're gonna run over our broadcasting but, time. Like, yeah, well, I think I think five minutes late people, isn't isn't probably one of the. That's not care. one of the times that people I, care about. But there's some. Times. I never give an end date to any of the content that I do. Yeah, that's exactly. Just, that's, that's just how content on the internet is. Like, yeah. starting on time is is something that is definitely a a problem in the industry, but it's never. I mean, the only, I, I think that the only people that can really get in trouble for that are the, the MLGs, the Dream Hacks, uh, and the ESLs of the world and the GOMs of the world. Because if, like, they've got like 40,000 people waiting to watch the stream and they're an hour late, that kind of sucks. Yeah, I think that, that our, our delay is, is when it starts becoming a problem. Like, I'm, I, I'm actually very happy with so far. I know we've only done three shows, but it's, I'm quite happy with ha the, the punctuality sure. of our show. Yeah, so give it I'll time. Work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, that was something that I, I uh, saw it repeated quite a few times every time we asked the question. So. I saw a great question that just came up there, uh, JP, and uh, I know I don't want to 
keep you too long, but I, I will ask you this one, and then I think we'll start wrapping up. Uh, sure. It was, what's more important to you personally, uh, appealing to a large audience or quality of content? Ooh. Um, I think it has to be a mixture of both, and I think that quality probably will bring on a large audience. Like, if I start small and it stays small for a long time, I'm actually quite happy with that because that means that you've built a core audience, and that core audience is going to tell other people about the show, and hopefully they become a part of the core audience. Like, I don't want a flash in the pan show, which is kind of what the last Real Talk was, which sucks, and that's why I really haven't brought it back yet. Cause I'm, I don't, I don't want to ride that hype of having the views that it had and then expect the same views from the next episode and only getting 3,000 views on YouTube compared to like the 130 that, that Idris Real Talk has right now. Like, mm. I would rather have that core audience uh, by creating quality content because it is not that flash in the pan effect. And at the end of the day, I would be proud on creating quality content rather than having the 30 year or whatever the large viewership is, whatever that number is. Okay, well, look, I'm going to say one thing and then, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. And that is, obviously, I said at the start of the show, I want to reiterate it. I know I was a dick to you and, <laughs> uh, and I said a lot of harsh things. Uh, it's not uh, a problem. I, I know, I know, but I just want to say, yeah, yeah, I know that. But, like, obviously, if I was contributory in any way to you getting pissed off, you know, totally fucking apologize. That's not really what I set about to do. I don't want to be that guy. I don't. I, I can't stand here and moan about douchebags, which I like to do all the time. <laughs> if I then myself act like a douchebag, that makes me a hypocrite. So uh, I whole fucking heartedly uh, apologize. I'm sure I wasn't a factor. I don't think that much of myself. But if I was, again, take it as red. I'm sorry. No, so. man. See, I respect it because you you were a. I think you were a journalist in in those tweets, and you were. My my view of journalism is that you always aim for the truth, and I think that's what you were doing there. Because maybe the the sh name of the show was not truthful in that mm. regard. Because sometimes I probably it is was kind just of being talk. a dick, though. Like I I, I went through a Your phase on mine. Twitter I'll where I thought, <laughs> no, no, I went through a phase on Twitter where I thought I get more I get more fucking followers if I was just a prick to everyone. So I, w I went through that phase, and uh, you know it works yeah. dep depressingly. But uh, but anyway, yeah. so I said that. But look. Where where can we see your fantastic content next, JP? What have you got lined up for us in the in the immediate future? So tomorrow we've got State of the Game at 5 p.m. EDT. Myself, Todd Moonglade, who just actually qualified for WCS US Round of Eight, mm -hmm. and a fourth person that I still have not locked in. Uh, maybe Grubby. It may not be Grubby. I'm still kind of working on that. Hopefully I can lock that in tonight and announce it. Um, then role play is going to be, it's usually on Sundays, but if you want to watch myself and control uh, Ryan Moore, the MLG2 admin, Live in Pink, and the SC2ratings.com uh, dev play Dungeons and Dragons for whatever reason, you can come watch us. Uh, that's going to be this next week, Tuesday at 9 p.m. EDT at uh, twitch.tv slash hitmejp. And uh, your Twitter is is uh, on there. I don't know if we've got it right, so just reiterate uh, in case it's we good. have got it. You got it. Oh, we got it. Right. Brilliant. <laughs> so uh, look again. Thanks for coming on the show. I think we've covered some very interesting areas. It was nowhere near as car crash as the last show we did with uh, Thorin and Slasher. I Everyone's... managed to stay in for the whole one this time. Yeah, I know. And, <laughs> and James even got some air time, which is fantastic. So, uh, But seriously, uh, I hope we get to do it again in the future. Uh, anything, you know, content-wise that we can plug or help with, definitely hit us up. We're, uh, we are big fans, despite what some of our Twitter accounts might suggest. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed being on the show, Richard. Uh, it's and, great and stuff. Okay, so we'll wrap it up there. I want to thank all of the people who uh, tuned in, of course. I want to thank our guests. That is the great DJ Wheat and the great JP McDaniel, uh, two content editors. I hope we kind of covered the topic uh, that we were trying to do and went into some areas. But, of course, realistically, the kind of stuff we hang around the show is irrelevant. It is just two prolonged interviews with great people who've got things to say. So we are going to be back in a fortnight again. And what we're hoping for is we're going to have, uh, 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 well, we're hoping for Sundance. 
We, we can't be sure. We've got some backup shows planned, but uh, we are hoping for Sundance and that one. And we're going to be talking about esports as a business, uh, how MLG rose to the top of the tree, venture capital, all of that interesting stuff, and what a great guy to talk to about it. So uh, it, it, be thinking about that. If it doesn't happen, we'll let you know in advance. Um, and obviously, I would like to thank the producer, Streamgasm, and of course, my co-host, James, who I shall now let have the last word before we sign off. Yeah, thank you for everyone who sent in messages and things. You're like you've been great this week. Um, there's been a hell of a lo like lot of um, stuff being said, and I've been reading it all. And it's been great. So thank you for all of you, not just for watching, but for taking part in the chat and everyone who's been, you know, being really vocal. So it's great. Yeah, awesome, awesome Twitch TV chat tonight. Someone said it was like the esports Illuminati. So uh, it's great. That's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, if you want to interact with people who uh, matter in esports, they're all in our Twitch TV chat, so be sure to tune in next time. But until then, thanks very much for watching the Esports Heaven Show. Thanks to our guests. Thanks to everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. That's what a fortnight means. Peace. <laughs>